you something now. I can't stand a damn thief, for one. These ghetto thugs, you a thug if you steal, went into this supermarket, shooting up the whole place, busting bullets through Cheetos and Doritos, and stole 50 to to $100. I'm trying to figure out, and get this, y'all, this is the kicker. This is going to trip you out. The supermarket was hiring. They was looking for people to apply. They was looking for new employees. So I'm trying to figure out why they just didn't fill out an application. I, I, I'm confused. Like, then, this is another kicker. This is going to trip you out. So come to find out. They planned this robbery. So all that planning and researching and thinking y'all was doing, I'm trying to figure out why y'all just didn't uh, fill out some applications online. You had time to plan out a damn robbery. Don't you got time to do your to do an application? Walmart always hiring. For all y'all thieves, let me give you a list of the people that's hiring. Burger King looking for new crew members. Um, McDonald's looking for new crew members. Taco Bell's. KFC, Church of Chicken, always hiring. Uh, did I say, yeah, Wal I already said Walmart. Target. Uh, shit, go work at the skate ring. Hell, listen here. Tico and Taco, the ones that ain't got no damn green card, if they can get a job, your American citizen's ass can get a job too, okay? Get out there and cut some grass like Tico and Taco. Shit. So, don't be out here robbing people. This is stupid. People are always hiring, looking for employees. And there are jobs that hire felons. Now, if you got a gun felony, you know, for pistol whipping people, you may need to cut some damn grass. Because I wouldn't even hire you if you were known for pistol whipping people. <laughs> you ain't about to pistol with me when I tell you you got to come in to work. <laughs> I done fell in love with some mustaches, y'all, y'all. Mm -hmm. I used to get them peanuts that's like two for one. But no, nah, I get mustachios now. I recommend these. Well, good morning. This is uh, Lou Benninger. And i uh, not quite sure how you ended up on this station. But uh, if you're here, maybe it's Divine Providence. And it's God's will for your life. Well, I'm not a radio preacher, but uh, we're just out here in East Linda, uh, kind of a rough area out here on Mount Hooth. Today, we didn't have to throw it into four-wheel drive to get up here. It's like sunny outside, and just, there's just a slight whiff of cannabis in the air as we drove in. But uh, Wiki Man, Santos Vigil, and I are sitting here all alone. I just saw hey, saw, I just saw Danny Disco this week. I ran into him in a parking lot, and he wanted to know what was shaking. We used to have all these characters out here with us, but they forsook us. And they went over and started themselves their own station. So we're just, uh, you know, we're just down here in the bunker standing up for what's right. So it's Saturday for all those in all of us or Linda. You know, when you're not working... It doesn't matter what day it is or what time it is, but um, I know you're going to get up at the crack of noon and get started out there after tweaking all night. Tweaker James, I talked to Tweaker James recently. You know, a few years ago, we did a remodel out here, so we had to move into Tweaker James' garage because he had all that stolen equipment out there, and we broadcasted out his garage for a while till they could remodel this place. So any mice running around this morning out here? I don't think so. I think I think the big kahuna, he threw out these, looked like Skittles all over the floor out here. Good thing I don't have any toddlers. They'd be woofing down this mice, uh, mice food. So if you're listening, that's great. If you're not, I hope you're having a good time out there and behaving yourself. This is KMYC Radio. It is the Patriot. And we used to call it the state of Jefferson, but somebody stole my second banner out of here. We have enemies within, just like we do in the state of California. It's California, as one of my friends call it, California. So in the United States, we have enemies within that are trying to destroy the country, and we have en enemies within the radio station here stealing stuff. When we put up something that they don't like, they just take it down, steal it, right? 
It's like uh, Terrence was staying at, saying at the beginning of the show, he didn't like thieves. I don't either. So uh, let's see. What else should I tell you? I should tell you the fact that we have a phone out here. It's 530-742-5555. So 530-742-5555. So we will answer the phone today. Uh, sometimes we do a pre-record if one, one or the other of us can't come in on Saturday. So we just pre-record and run it. We try not to do a redo. If you can't listen to the show or you have poor reception or something's going wrong, you can go on uh, later, maybe uh, by tomorrow, to One Eye Blind Media on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, then type in four words, full words, One Eye Blind Media, and then click on playlists, and boom, you can click on Live with Lou, choose your show, and listen to it in portions, however you want. It's at your leisure. You can also listen on uh, kmycradio.com and just click on the listen live button. And if we're live streaming, it'll work. Now, some some of the people run the technology out here, if it doesn't work, they blame it on, what do they blame it on? Sunbursts? Sunbursts or rats or tweakers or something's fouling it up. But uh, if all else fails here, you can go to One Eye Blind Media. So, uh, we are here because people want us to be here. Um, certain people do other people hate us, but that's, uh, I got about people. Sometimes people say, I really like you. And I say, well, <laughs> I'm happy for that because there's a lot of people that don't. And I, it's just kind of the way things have worked out in my life. So I'm comfortable with that. And so, uh, we are on the air because we have some people that like to financially help us be on the air because the big kahuna out here doesn't pay me to be here. Uh, some of my friends got interested in me being on the air years ago. And I told them, I'm glad you're interested because I'm not. But anyway, we ended up on the air long story short. And so that we got some supporters, you'll hear their advertisements on here. Green, it's constructions, one longtime friend, he always fixes all the things that fall apart on my house. I go to different people if parts of my body fall off. I go to different people for that. But Greenest Construction is the best there is in town. And then Ted Holmes with the plumbing doctor. Um, he also has liftoff floor removal if you want to have your floor removed and put a different floor down. And But the plumbing doctor, whenever the water in my house is going backwards, I call the plumbing doctor and they come and fix me. And so those two and the other ones recently are the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots who uh, I'm grateful that they like me to talk about them and they help me financially because uh, I like what they do out there and I like the Tea Party. I like the idea of the Tea Party when it started. So uh, they meet in the Yuba Sutter area, I know there's people talking or listening from different counties. And so you may have a tea party in your county. It wouldn't surprise me, but we have a, these guys call themselves the Sutter Beach tea party Patriots. And they include Yuba and Sutter counties. And they meet up at church of glad tidings on the first and third Monday nights of the month at six 30. And you can slide in there at six o'clock if you want. And they'll probably have some refreshments, some coffee for you. But, uh, a friend of mine is going to be speaking this coming Monday night. His name is Jason Rikard, R-I-K-A-R-D, Jason Rikard. And he actually has worked for government before, and he's also working in private industry in the construction business. But I got to know Jason a little bit. He ran for city council in Yuba City, and uh, he caught my attention because one day on Facebook he was promoting uh, – a store, a guy that owned a store in Yuba City named Kumar Kairam. And the problem was over there that the city of Yuba City were putting restrictions on what he could sell and what he couldn't sell. And so uh, anyway, I got interested in that and realized that I knew Kumar. So recently, uh, the city, after three years of restricting the type of alcohol he could sell, they were restricting him from selling of all the alcohol you could or couldn't sell, he could not sell a 16-ounce beer, a single 16-ounce beer. How stupid does that sound? 
Well, honestly, when you get into government, there's lots of stupid stuff going on. So Jason Reichart began to beat the drum that that was, it wasn't about beer. It was about a person's right to be free. And so anyway, Jason is going to speak uh, at the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots this coming Monday night, the 20th. And he's going to be talking about disaster preparedness, which has been a, a hobby of his and kind of a mission of his personal mission to help people uh, be prepared for whatever shakes down in their life. I'm talking about a disaster like flood, fire, uh, just something major happens in the community where you need to get up and go, right? And you don't have much time to think about it. So he helps people think about that and prepare for that in very practical ways, food, how to provide your own utilities, uh, what if you need to leave immediately, uh, preparing what they call a go bag, all those kind of things. So this uh, this Monday night, also they're having a big raffle where they're raffling off all kinds of ammo, ammunition for those who are not used to that ammo. So there's all kinds of nine millimeter, two twenty three, variety of two twenty three, twenty twos uh, ammunition. There are going to be two drawings. And uh, anyway, the, if you want to here's the here's the thing just support the tea party chip in some money you might win some ammo and if if you win some ammo that you don't need give it to a friend who needs it or you could go go get a gun and then be prepared to shoot somebody when they come through your front door or if we have to take over the government either way so we ain't gonna be able to take over the government without any weapons if you think that's radical sounding you've lost touch with the founding fathers that's the reason we have the second amendment not so you could shoot a squirrel or, or you could shoot your neighbor who's trying to molest your daughter. Uh, it was to take over the government who has taken away our rights. Pretty simple, huh? You, it may sound radical to you, but you just never studied history. That's all. So the other, uh, let's see, the other people that uh, are supporting us is Elite Security. Monty Hecker owns that operation. And or you, if you look on the website, it calls itself elite universal security but i just i think most people call them elite security and so you can check them out they operate out of yuba county but they're also up in redding and chico and if you want to get involved in the security business or you need some security say if if law enforcement isn't able to provide the level of security that you need these guys will monitor your business your house or whatever and but they they do so much more than that elite security they have this thing called an api academy and uh they do these kinds of trainings check this out uh they pepper spray training handcuff training taser certified training uh de-escalation of force training armed security guard training exposed and ccw firearms training uh guard training so the cool thing about this is you can start getting involved out there at 18 years of age. So you may still be in high school and you're as soon as you crank over to 18 and you want to start getting some training and the things I just mentioned, uh, you can dial them up at 749-0280, 749-0280. And if you miss that, you can just Google it, Elite Universal Security. They're out, out in uh, – what I used to call West Linden, now they call it Oliverst. But uh, they're a great organization, and you might see some of their people working around town. And so you can go on their website, which is a good website. I've checked it out, elite.api-academy.com, elite.api-academy.com. So those are some people that uh, make it happen. Uh we're out here talking for food. These guys just pay the bills that I got to pay the big kahuna out here to keep us going. Otherwise, uh, glad you're listening. I want to mention to you, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, this marijuana thing. They were talking in the previous show about uh, people in the city of Marysville. They were mentioning they're going to have a couple dispensaries. Uh, and the city council, which I thought was going to end up uh, allowing those dispensaries to sell marijuana to anybody. They they put a limit on that. I don't know how long that's going to last. It seems like every six months or a year, the laws keep changing on marijuana. So 
uh, Yuba County citizens have voted multiple times to say we don't want dispensaries on our county. The city of Marysville said we don't care. Uh, I'm talking about the leaders of the city, not the citizens. The citizens of Yuba County, which includes Marysville, said we don't want marijuana dispensaries in our community. And uh, they may be, we may be one of the poorest counties in California, but we're not the dumbest. And so uh, I think that was a wise decision on behalf of the citizens. But the city council of Marysville said we're going to have dispensaries, and it had nothing to do with uh, anything utilitarian or moral. It was all to do with making money off marijuana. So the next time you think, oh, I don't like these drug dealers making money off all this stuff, well, that's exactly what the government of the city of Marysville is going to do is make money off marijuana. So, uh, but recently they voted to restrict that sales to folks that have a medical marijuana card, a two, what they used to call a 215 card. So I was, you know, browsing around. I'm always looking for things. I think, oh, maybe I should talk about that in the radio. But I ran across this editorial from the Colorado Springs Gazette. <clears throat> you know, Colorado has kind of been the forerunner for uh, legalizing marijuana. In other words, you don't have to have any special permission, a card back there that you have a medical condition. You can just, if you want to smoke it, you can smoke it. So you, I don't know whether you think about it, but five years has gone by since they made that decision. And, you know, on January 1st of this coming year, 2018, we're going to, in California, uh, that's going to come into play here. So uh, let me just get the high points and give you what, what uh, this article says. This is an, uh, uh, an editorial for the Colorado, Colorado Springs Gazette, 2017, November 14th. Uh, and here's what they say. This is their opinion from the newspaper business of what it's looked like after five years. It says, last week marked the fifth anniversary of Colorado's decision to sanction the world's first anything-goes commercial pot trade. Five years later, we remain an embarrassing cautionary tale. Visitors to Colorado remark about a new agricultural smell, the wafting or wafting odor of pot as they drive near warehouse grow operations along Denver freeways. Residential neighborhoods throughout Colorado Springs reek of marijuana as producers fill rental homes with plants. Five years of retail pot coincide with five years of homelessness growth rate that ranks among the highest rates in the country. Directors of homeless shelters and people who live on the streets tell us homeless substance, abuse, substance abusers migrate here for easy access to pot. Five years of big marijuana ushered in a doubling in the number of drivers involved in fatal crashes who tested positive for marijuana based on research by the pro legalization Denver post five years of commercial pot have been five years of more marijuana in schools and teachers and administrators ever feared an investigation by education news Colorado <clears throat> solutions and I news network shows drug violations reported by Colorado's K-12 schools have increased 45% in the past four years, even as the combined number of all other violations have fallen, explains an expose on ex escalating pot use in schools by the Rocky Mountain PBS in late 2016. So you can see this is a wide range of people reporting this from liberals to conservative. So the investigation found an increase in high school drug violations of 71% since legalization. School suspensions for drugs increased 45%. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health found Colorado ranks first in the country for marijuana use among teens, scoring well above the national average. The only good news to celebrate on this anniversary is the dawn of another organization to push back against big marijuana's threat to kids, teens, and young adults. The Marijuana Accountability Coalition formed November 6 in Denver and will establish satellite groups throughout the state. It resulted from discussions among recovery professionals, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there's a, people are concerned, and now they're saying maybe we shouldn't have done this, and they're pushing back. So it says, 
quote, it's one thing to decriminalize marijuana. It's an entirely different thing to legalize an industry that has commercialized a drug that is devastating our youth, youth and devastating whole communities, said coalition founder Justin Luke Riley. Coloradans need to know, other states, other states need to know that Colorado is suffering from massive normalization and commercialization of this drug, which has resulted in Colorado being the number one state for youth drug use in the country. Kids are being expelled at higher rates and more road deaths tied to pot have resulted since legalization, according to Justin Luke Riley. Well, uh, they finally, their final closing comment is commercial pots. Five year anniversary is an odious occasion for those who want safer streets, healthier kids, and less suffering associated with substance abuse. Experts say the worst effects of widespread pot use will culminate, culminate over decades. If so, we can only imagine the somber nation of Big Marijuana's 25th birthday, according to Cal Colorado Springs Gazette. So, uh, fascinating uh, report from Colorado themselves. Uh, on marijuana so uh, the interesting thing is a lot of things we decide uh, on policies in a in society whether it's uh well usually it happens at the government level with the city council board of supervisors or state a new philosophy a new way of going about life many times it takes decades to see the impact for instance when i think of policy changes on how you know, in other words, what we reward and what we punish. So Walter Williams, the economist from George Mason University, he's actually retired, but he, he would say in government, what, what we want more of, we subsidize. And well, what, what we want less of, we tax. And so what we did in the 1960s, for instance, with the war on poverty under Lyndon Johnson, they came to the conclusion social scientists did back then at, in the, the government level that one way to solve poverty would be just to give people money. And if you raise their income level, then they magically end up out of poverty. But they didn't consider that in the national forests that they, they found uh, the forest rangers and people that understand animal behavior, they realized that if you feed animals, they will quit foraging for themselves and end up being domesticated, right? And they won't, uh, they won't be motivated by fear and a desire for survival to, to fend for themselves and get up and go to work even when they don't feel like it. So when they started paying people to not work, paying people, in other words, to be out of poverty, Many people that were working and, and were what we would consider the working poor or starting out in life or getting some skills, they said, hey, we can, why work if they'll just give us money? At, and in other words, we can go down and collect money. So they quit, many quit work. And that left, it left uh, or uh, ended up creating generation after generation after generation after generation of people that didn't know anything other than um, collecting from government, or they they just knew only that government took care of them, and they just waited for the check to come every month and just went about their daily task and, and never thought about getting a career, going to work, getting skills, or anything else. And it was an exception to the rule when anybody would, like, break out of that routine. So... Uh, that's what happens when you set policies 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, you realize that you just screwed the entire society over and you ruined generations of Americans, uh, whether it's sexual freedom, whether it's, hey, let's do drugs, that's really, the, that's really the cool thing to do. And all of a sudden, 10, 20 years later, when the party's over, you just end up being addicted. So uh, we're going to be here for another two and a half hours. We're going to, somebody said, Lou, when you took a break, you said, we'll see you. So they thought it was over last week. So it, there's two and a half long hours left. So you can, if you want to hang in there, we're going to go to a break. Be right back. Don't leave.
Carter thought his life was over when he landed in jail. What he didn't know was that all the pieces of an intricate puzzle had come together for just such a time. This Christmas experienced the great love that motivates such planning and purpose to reach each and every one of us. Creative Light Theater presents the original modern musical, The Ripple Effect, featuring a powerhouse cast of 16 actors and 15 original songs that pulse with passion and reveal the deepest thoughts of people in crisis. This musical drama shows the purpose in suffering and grants us a glimpse of what goes on in the heart of God. The Ripple Effect world premiere is December 8th through 12th, 7 p.m. nightly, at the Embassy Theater at Glad Tidings, Highway 99 and Eager Road in Yuba City. Admission is free. Experience the epic lengths God will go to for the love of one person. So in this brave new world in which sexual abuse is now bordering on trendy, can we maybe start discussing our morality problem now? Hey guys, I'm Brittany Hughes, you're watching MRC TV, and this is your reality check. Now if you are a nasty perv who thinks that it's okay to grab women whenever you want, expose yourself to them, molest them in hotel rooms, or otherwise knowingly harass or assault them, then screw you. There's a reason that I encourage women to exercise their Second Amendment right to bear arms, and it is largely so that they can protect themselves against predators. But if you are one of the vast majority of men who aren't running around sexually abusing women, Listen up. Don't you dare grovel before this feminist agenda that's now accusing all men of being the problem. Don't cower in fear just because some shrieking banshee has now decided that you complimenting your coworker's new haircut constitutes sexual harassment. I am sick and tired of women being told that we're all helpless victims of male fixation. We're not. And I'm sick of men being told that they're all just a bunch of rapists in waiting. They aren't. We don't have a men problem. We have a morality problem, and it is not particular to guys. We started throwing condoms at our fifth graders, and now we marvel at why there are so many little sex-crazed perverts running around. We taught future generations that sex and people are cheap, and now we wonder why they don't value either. We normalize porn and parade women around as objects, and then we are stunned when they're objectified. Our magazines glamorize college orgies and elite Hollywood sex parties, and then we're shocked when someone ends up abused. Really? When anyone dares to suggest that sexual morality and modesty are important and that maybe we should teach them to our children, we are screamed down, called self-righteous bigots, and told to stop judging. Mike Pence says that he won't have dinner alone with a woman who's not his wife to avoid even the appearance of impropriety, and he is mocked for it. And then somehow everyone is floored when nobody seems to have any boundaries anymore. Society demanded a world without standards where sexual self-control is outdated, where anything goes and the lines don't matter. Well, congratulations. Now you've got one. And that's your Reality Check America. Subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook and Twitter, and stay sane out there. All right, welcome back. If you are late arriving today, this is Live with Lou here with Santos and we're uh, blasting here for the next two and a half hours till noon and we are live so you can dial us up if you want but we got plenty to talk about if you think oh I need to help that guy out uh, we're all right but if you have something you got to say 742 we are pro-choice station so we may or may not let you on depending on what how the impact on my career and stuff and what gender you are we are gender if we got for if if our feminine sides coming out at the moment, we will let a female through. If not, we're just, we're hosing off females and sticking with males or it could be vice versa. Hey, I wanted to make mention, uh, some friends of mine, <clears> that <throat> Jeff and Cherie Stevens, they farm in Sutter County, but they also make lots of pastries and stuff called pies. And, uh, the other, we had our trauma intervention <clears throat> monthly training last Thursday night, not just two days ago, but last week, previous week. And, uh, some of the, one of the volunteers brought in two pumpkin pies from Stevens farmhouse. I love pumpkin pie. Whoa. I don't even bring sweets in the house because I'm an addict and I just sit down and eat the whole pie in one sitting, knock down a pot of coffee. 
and call it a night. So, uh, but the Jeff Stevens for four years was the trauma intervention volunteer and what a great guy to start with. But while he was out on these trauma intervention calls, he was so amazed the work law enforcement does and, and also the others fire the uh, bi-county ambulance and the hospital, but they want to do something for law enforcement a few years ago. And so they started law enforcement pie day and this is the third year they're doing it. And so on, on December 17th, that's a Sunday, they're going to distribute pies, maybe over 1200 pies. Is that amazing? That's a lot of pie, uh, to Yuba Sutter counties. And now I just realized that they're also going to do Butte and Calusa. These guys are amazing. So Yuba Sutter, Butte and Calusa, they, they do all the coordinating on getting the pies and connecting the pies. They make the pies and then connect the pies to the law enforcement people so that every kind of law enforcement you can imagine. And, uh, but they're also going to do a, uh, a breakfast, a pancake breakfast. They just keep adding on to this thing. First of all, it was just Yuba and Sutter. Then they went to Calusa. Now they're going to Butte, but they're going to have at the Veterans Center in Yuba City at the corner of Civic Center Boulevard and Butte House Road. They're going to distribute the pies from there, but they're going to have a breakfast for law enforcement. I, and they're also going to give some prizes out, all that kind of stuff. It's a free pancake breakfast that's going to be hosted by the Exchange Club of Marysville, which is always a big promoter of law enforcement, great club. <clears throat> and, um, uh, so they may feed, feed everybody. I don't know. I, it doesn't say here whether they're going to feed the general public or not, but probably are, but I'll clear that up later. Sutter County Veterans Center. Here's how you can get involved. You can sponsor a pie for a law enforcement person by just giving $10 contribution to the Stevens farmhouse can, uh, Stevens farmhouse. Uh, and you can do that by going out there or you could just dial them up, probably just swipe a credit card and, uh, do that. So you could call them up at six, seven, three, zero, four, zero, six. They are located out off, uh, about seven miles south of Yuba city on highway 99. If you just head towards Sacramento on 99, they're on the right side, about seven miles out. It's called the number 6219, but they have signs up there. You'll see them. You could go out there and do it, or you could just send them a check in the mail. 6219. It's actually called Sawtell road, but it's highway 99, but 6219 Sawtell Yuba city, <clears throat> but you could mail a check for a hundred dollars or something, do 10 pies and they'll take care of the rest. They cook them, they package them, <clears throat> they deliver them, uh, over to the veteran center. And that's where the, all the law enforcement people come in and just pick them up and take them back to their, uh, headquarters or in individual people will pick them up. Anyway, the, all the money is going to go to the pies and any additional money, like a people donate extra money or whatever, it will go to help the cascade fire victims. If you're new to the area, that's the fire we just had that devastated, uh, hundreds of homes up in the Loma Rica, um, area in Yuba County, just above us here above the station. So, uh, you know, if it's Thanksgiving week and, uh, maybe you're thankful that your house didn't burn, right? And maybe you're thankful that, uh, you're, that the Orville dam didn't break last year and you're you, you escaped without having to muck out your house and, and rebuild your house. We've been through that numbers of times here in Yuba and Sutter County. So, uh, and other counties, Buttes had floods, Calusa's had floods. So maybe you just, you're thankful, or maybe you're just thankful that, that, uh, you feel secure in your city. And a lot of times we can just take, the cops for granted. I, I've always thought when people start complaining about law enforcement, I thought, you know, what we should do is just take a more, have a moratorium on cops for a month and just say, tell them to take the month off, shut, shut down the police stations, shut down nine 11, nine one, one, and, uh, just kind of just handle it on our own. See how that goes for a while. And, uh, I think that would, 
help some people, right? I think a lot of things we can handle on our own that we don't. We get kind of sissified, but sometimes you, you need law enforcement to take care of some business, right? And, you you know, the interesting thing is I, I had this fact, Jeff, Jeff Stevens, who's running this pie operation with his wife, Cherie, he learned one time, he said, Lou, I heard that you, you and some other guys help paint out the graffiti in the Yuba Sutter area. <clears throat> I said, yeah, we do, Jeff. He said, oh, it doesn't seem like it's, we, we have much of a problem here. And I said, well, that's because it's, we paint it out. <laughs> if you just left it all up, dude, it's like garbage. It's like if recology start picking up, stop picking up the garbage. How, how's that going to work in about a couple weeks? You ever seen these garbage guys go on strike in like Philadelphia or something? And it just gets smelly and funky and rat infested quick. So, uh, you know, the Bible says that law enforcement are law enforcement people are ministers of God. Did you know that? Even though they may not know anything about God, they are ministers of God. And you know what their role is? To keep a lid on this sucker till Jesus gets back, because it's gnarly out there. So if if you just are feeling like, hey, I feel safe today, I feel like protected, maybe you ought to thank a law enforcement official and a military person, right? So you can chip in ten dollars a piece, and uh, or you could uh, per pie, and uh, that's six seven three zero four zero six. Maybe you don't even live in Yuba Sutter counties or Butte County or Calusa County. Fortunately, this radio station's getting into all four of those counties. And you just appreciate law enforcement. I uh, spent last week, I was over at Marysville Police Department briefing the new uh, one, one, two shifts of police officers. In fact, they were mostly all new to me. They're, there's just a constant turnover as people retire, move on, do whatever. And so I did Yuba County the previous week, Yuba County Sheriff, and now I'm doing Yuba City or Marysville Police. And then next week I do Marysville Police again briefing these guys and gals there's females and males and i'm just uh, so proud to be involved with them because they are the salt of the earth and uh type folks so i want to encourage you to do that that's a small token did i say the number wrong six seven three zero four zero six is that wikiman's telling me the number yeah that's the number Six seven three zero four zero six is the number, and just dial them up, and you can connect on this thing. So uh, this is Thanksgiving week, and I have a clip I want to play. Are you thinking about that clip? So I want to. There's, you know, I, I played a clip here the other day about Veterans Day, and people commented about. It. They said, "Lou, thanks so much for educ." Because we have all these days and holidays and memorial days and a lot of times we have no idea what we're even celebrating in fact i celebrated christmas most of my two decades of my life and never even knew jesus was involved i know i'm a little slow i'm a slow learner i am a slow learner but i'm just admitting that to you but a lot of times we don't know what we're celebrating and so there's a lot of misunderstanding and it's a lot of baloney taught even in our public school system about thanksgiving so i wanted to play you a clip about that right now Food, football, and oppression. That's what Thanksgiving has come to mean to many Americans. Back in 2007, Seattle public school officials made national news by describing the holiday as a time of mourning and a bitter reminder of 500 years of betrayal. This new narrative describes the pilgrims as arrogant oppressors who fled persecution only to become persecutors themselves, depriving Native Americans of their land and their lives. But this is wrong on every count. First of all, the pilgrims didn't cross the ocean to flee persecution or even England. They'd been living for over a decade in Holland, Europe's most tolerant nation and a haven for religious dissenters. Free from interference by the Church of England, they feared seduction not persecution, worrying that their children would be corrupted by the materialistic Dutch culture. That's why they risked their dangerous 1620 voyage to a wilderness continent, not because they were running from oppression, but because they were running toward holiness, fulfilling a fateful mission to build an ideal Christian commonwealth. They initially planned to plant this model society on the wild, wolf-infested island known to natives as 
Manhattan, but winds and tides blew them 250 miles off course, dumping the Mayflower on the frozen coast of Massachusetts. Somehow, the Pilgrims saw their dire situation as a demonstration of providential power, especially after a giant wave picked up the flimsy boat of a scouting party on a stormy December night. The turbulent sea then deposited them safely, miraculously, on a little island within sight of the ideal location for their settlement. It was a deserted Indian village with cleared land, stored supplies of corn, and a reliable source of fresh water. No, these supposedly cruel conquerors never actually invaded that village. Instead, they expressed a fervent desire to pay the natives for the dried corn they found. If only they could find someone to pay. But the former inhabitants had perished during three years of plague, probably smallpox, that immediately preceded the pilgrims' arrival. One of the few survivors of that devastation turned up several months later to welcome the English newcomers. Against all odds, he proved to be the single human being on the continent best suited to help the struggling settlers, since he spoke English and had already embraced Christianity. His name was Squanto, and he had grown up in this very village before a ruthless sea captain kidnapped him as a boy and sold him into slavery in Spain. After four years, he was freed by kindly monks, then made his way to England, and finally sailed across the Atlantic, only to find his friends and family all wiped out by disease. Over the next few months, Squanto helped the English newcomers plant crops and negotiate a friendly trade agreement with the region's most important chief, Massasoit. No wonder pilgrim leader William Bradford called Squanto a special instrument sent of God for their good. The celebration, later known as the First Thanksgiving, actually involved a three-day harvest festival in October, apparently inspired by the biblical holiday of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Ninety hungry Indian warriors joined the 53 surviving pilgrims for this occasion. Nearly half of the colonists had died during the brutal winter. The Englishmen provided some vegetables, fish, and perhaps wild turkeys, while the natives brought five recently hunted deer as house gifts. The preferred sport on this occasion wasn't football, but shooting with settlers and Indians sharing a fierce fascination with guns. Though these hardy pilgrims loom large in the American imagination, they never built their Plymouth settlement into a major colony. And nearby Boston, the later colony of Massachusetts Bay, grew so much faster that it swallowed up the great-grandchildren of the pilgrims in 1691. But the sense of purpose of the original pilgrims left a permanent imprint on the national character. They maintained unshakable confidence that God protected them, not to grant special privileges, but to impose special responsibilities. They saw themselves as instruments, not authors, of a mysterious master plan. Today, with our continued blessings so obvious and so overwhelming, the only reason to treat this beloved national holiday as a time of mourning is that some foolish Americans actually think that's a good idea. The pilgrims knew better. They understood that people of every culture and every era can gain more from gratitude than from guilt. I'm Michael Medved for Prager University. All right. Well, I hope that helped you. I was listening uh, to the radio the other day, and, and somehow I ended up on a PBS channel, and some idiot was saying, we, you know, we killed off the Indians by bringing a disease here. Like, the way he said it was like we bottled it up in Europe and uh, threw it like Molotov cocktails into their their villages. So it's interesting to note what Medved just said, that when they arrived, vil a village was totally abandoned. In fact, there was food in the village, and it was abandoned because it had been wiped out by disease, uh, not brought by the, the folks from Europe, but disease on, on the American continent. And it, it's 
amazing to me how liberals will cast the uh, the understanding that uh, the continent here prior to the Europeans coming across was somehow disease free and everybody just loved one another. They forget the parts about certain in certain uh, if you want to call them Indian or certain indigenous groups, indigenous peoples here were very peaceful and others were very violent. Others, certain groups were uh, wanted to take over other groups, would steal from other groups, would uh, kill and steal their women, kill their uh, kill everything, sacrificed people. I don't know whether you've sacrificed a person lately, but uh, indigenous people in North and South America sacrificed human beings uh, to demons. Uh, if you don't believe in demons, it really doesn't make any difference. It, the problem is most people don't understand what they're talking about. And so when somebody goes on the radio and say, we brought disease and we brought, um, we murdered everybody, uh, they're just nuts. So when you go to Walmart, there's people in Walmart walking around shopping that have diseases, right? And the reason you don't get them is because your immune system is kicking their butt as you suck in that air from your person that's next to you in line. They're packing a, there's packing a bug, right? There's bugs all over. So to blame the Europeans for coming over. And the other thing I get a kick out of, I, I've been reading uh, history lately, or the hi founding of America. And it's so amazing how our understanding gets skewed by all the baloney uh, in the media. But, you know, it's kind of like the white folks, kind of like British and French, get all the blame for coming over here and trash and everything. It was actually the Spanish. So I think, you know, if you, if you look at, if you look, you know, particularly when these Mexican people are throwing the La Raza and those people are like complaining about Californians and they need to take this back or take, if they want to get all pissy, they should go and take it out on Spain. They're the ones that came, came in and killed all a bunch of Aztecs and enslaved people and Mayans and Inca people. Uh, that those boys were from Spain. And, uh, that's why if you ever look on Spanish TV and you see a bunch of really light skinned folks with different colors, hair and stuff, that would be sp the Spanish lineage over there, right? The European lineage mixed in with the indigenous people of Mexico. You know, folks, a lot of you just don't get out enough. If you went to Mexico a lot, you would meet a lot of people like the Oaxacan people from Oaxaca, the state of Oaxaca down there, Guatemala, or you'd meet the Mistec people or the Aztec people. And you'd, you'd say, well, when you mix those people with Spanish people, then you get Mexicans, right? And, uh, you know, my friend Ted Holmes was down there working in missions work. He, he was shocked. He said, you know, Lou, Mexicans down here, they shoot Oaxacan people for sport. Isn't that unbelievable? They shoot Oaxacan people. Oaxacans are beautiful, small very small st of stature, four, four to five feet tall, really reddish brown skin with high cheekbones. They shoot them for sport out here in the, isn't that gnarly? That's down there in Mexico, folks. You know, all you Mexicans up here want to, got an ax to grind up here in California. Maybe you should go down there and maybe straighten out some of your own folks. Like, you know, do a little reformation down there in Mexico. Well, uh, anyway, we got a lot to be thankful for, and and I hope you're going to have a great Thanksgiving. I love turkey. Do you like turkey? I like turkey. I could eat turkey every single day. Turkey sandwich or turkey this, turkey that. I'm a turkey guy. And uh, so I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. A lot to be thankful for, even when there's all kinds of problems. There's always things to get. You know, it's like Medved said, it's always better to have a grateful heart. And look for something to be grateful for. Have an attitude of gratitude instead of all being bitter about what didn't go right. All of us can point to things that didn't go right. I certainly can in my life. So, uh, But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to have an attitude of gratitude for what went right, what I'm thankful for. Well, there's a lot of action out there. Uh, we played a clip here a bit ago about uh, 
society demanding no sexual values, no sexual norms, just do whatever you want. Remember I talked earlier about policies that we launched that decades later, like I was telling the kids in juvenile hall last week, I said, whatever you want in life, plant those kind of seeds. So I said, if you want to have a, a loving life, then be loving to people. You want to have a good life, plant those kind of seeds, because when you plant some funky seeds in your yard, or in your life, you're going to reap those babies. And don't be whining when it comes up all gnarly. So all of a sudden, oh, my God, you know, people are molesting people and people are forcing women to have this and that. Hey, we've been planting those seeds since the 60s. And it, it didn't just start in the 60s. People have always been sinful. In other words, do something, we, we get out of our lane. But then we, in the 60s, we encouraged people to get out of their lane, right? Oh, we don't need to be married. We can just shack up together, right? We don't, we, well, we don't, you know, we're going to test drive everything before we, like, make a commitment, right? And so it doesn't make any difference. I'm just reading about, I'm going to talk about Harvey Milk later. Uh, we're celebrating. We have Harvey Milk. We celebrate Harvey Milk, and he liked to have sex with 15-year-old boys, so when you start doing that, and then all of a sudden you want to whine about all these guys like Roman Polanski raping 13-year-old girls, you know, they accept it in Hollywood. All of a sudden now they're getting all sensitive about it, getting all flustered about it. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more when we come back, but we're going to take a break. It's our first hour. It's gone. We're coming back. I want you to remind everybody we're coming back. <laughs> at a middle school where I see teachers uh, day in and day out um, praise the leftist way of thinking and bash the conservative way of thinking and I just want to know uh, what you suggest I would do to not necessarily promote conservative conservatism but to just kind of keep a uh, objective like viewpoint with teaching the kids I mean so I think that the, the, the question is sort of Two part, even though it really isn't. Uh, the the first part is how do you do this without getting fired, right? I mean that that really is the question. One of the big problems at the public school level is that uh, it in in California you have to be a member of the teachers union to teach at a public school, and that's a disaster because the teachers unions are really discriminatory against people on the right, uh, and uh, they obviously take all your money and they spend it on leftist politicians like Jerry Brown, uh, and it's uh, and it's a serious problem. Um, you know, that's a question you're going to have to decide for yourself. How far can you go without getting fired? As far as what you can say to the kids, I think that it's perfectly fine to say. Here's an argument I heard one of your other teachers making today. It's a valid argument. Let me explain where I think it's mistaken. And if the other teacher has a problem with that, then let them talk with you about it in front of the class. Like this idea that, that you get a free feel to say whatever you want in a classroom without ever being contradicted, I think is incredibly stupid. And I think it's damaging to the kids, because especially, I mean, honestly, I think that one of the reasons that the left is, is actually vulnerable on campus, even though they seem invulnerable on campus, and I think this is true in high schools and, and junior highs as well, they never hear a good position on the right. So when they finally hear a good position on the right, a lot of them are convinced because they've never actually had to deal with those ideas before. If they had to deal with these ideas and actually debate for themselves whether they're true or not, they get a better perspective on where maybe they actually stand. So I would just suggest like, really going directly at it and saying, you, know, you may have heard from your teacher this. Here's the counter perspective. You can believe that other teacher, but here's the counter perspective and the data to back it up. All right. Well, we're in our second hour here, and... Um I got a uh, text from a lady that said she's said a lot of people have pain and they need painkillers. Did you understand me to say that people should be forbidden to smoke marijuana if they want or take it? I don't think I said that, but uh, you know, when my uh, the last marijuana I ever bought and sold, actually, I didn't sell it. I just i I'd, I'd become a Christian and I. Uh, I had left that drug scene behind <clears throat> many, many years ago, and uh, although I think there's an instructor out at Yuba College that thinks I'm still pushing drugs, he's at the police academy or something. But anyway, my uh, my brother-in-law was 41. He got lung and brain cancer, and he was in a lot of <clears throat> turmoil and pain. And so my sister, who had never 
smoked marijuana in her life or done any drugs, called me. She's 11 years old and said, hey, can you get some marijuana for for my husband? Because they say that if you try that, it can help you. It help your appetite and maybe he'll eat more because he was really sick. And so, uh, yeah, I scored a half pound of marijuana and shipped it to the mail down to my sister. And, uh, and that was the last, uh, my experience with that deal. But, you know, I've had all my people and in, in my family die of cancer and I've seen, uh, you know, mom knock down shots of morphine out of a cup and, uh, it's tough, you know? And so, you know, in America, more than any other place in the world, we have an amazing, uh, array of medications that can kill pain. And now it almost seems like with the op opioid epidemic, uh, everything up to fentanyl, which if you, if you just get some sprinkles of it on your skin, it will absorb it and it could kill you. So there's lots of stuff you can take. And my feeling is, Hey, if, if you want to come down to the fact that the only thing out there that you can find to take the edge off without a lot of side effects is marijuana, good on you. Uh, the problem is that the way this is happening is that it's, it's, uh, I, if, if you want to just say, Hey, just legalize all drugs and just like I can go to Vietnam and score stuff right over the counter that you have to get a prescription for here, like med, like, uh, antibiotics whether that's a good thing or a bad thing I, I think we're seeing in Colorado they're saying we're not quite sure we did the right thing so that's all I was really saying I want to talk about Chris Ann Hall Chris Ann Hall uh, most of us uh, if you're my age which is almost a hundred you, uh, you you still didn't get a lot of teaching about the Constitution. We had to study the Constitution in, in my classes in high school, at Marysville High School, uh, and take a test on it, right, on how laws were made and all that kind of stuff. My understanding is now they don't teach much about the Constitution, but we really didn't get into the Constitution and how it was formed and why it was formed and the guarantees we have and rights, and, and we didn't get into much much of the weeds on it, which is important because if you're going to create citizens, if you're going to mold citizens that know why the country is the way it is or how we got to where we are, you need to know the sense of history. And when we delete that out and just say it doesn't matter anymore, like Barack Obama used to say, it really is just a living document. And uh, if we don't like it, if it's not working for us now, we can change it up. Well, that's how nations have switched from one form of government to another, and that can get really funky. So Chris Ann Hall uh, is, it, you can get this through like Hillsdale College. You can get online courses at Hillsdale College for free. Amazing, just amazing Constitution courses. You can also go to Chris Ann Hall's website. Uh, we've had Chris Ann Hall a couple times come to town here. She is an amazing instructor. She's a former uh attorney i think for the department of justice in florida but then she f uh, got sideways with them when the tea party started up and they didn't like her affiliation with the tea party so they suggested she either quit the tea party or quit quit her attorney job and her her husband and her prayed about it and they thought we're going to quit the government job so she now is traveling all over the country chris ann hall teaching ignorant Americans about the Constitution because we're about to lose all our freedoms folks if you don't like when you hear the, hear the term globalists that means forget the Constitution we're gonna go with the one one world government that would be the George Bush's of the world Jeb Bush's of the world Karl Rove's of the world and so I want to encourage you to hook up with Chris Ann Hall and I'm gonna give you a website and you should go to a website and check it out. You can get on a monthly subscription uh, to her teaching, or you can just get stuff free off the website as well. It's Chris Ann, K R I S, common spelling Ann, A N N E, Hall, Chris Ann Hall, one word, dot com. And she runs an operation called Liberty First 
University. And it's, it, she says it's for an education and liberty worthy of the highest institution of learning as if the founders themselves were teaching it. Click here for a five-day trial. So you can click on, here on her website, and she will send stuff to your email box every day for five days, just stuff that you would never get to hear in a school. Now, if you're homeschooling, honestly, if I had kids today and I was homeschooling them, I would, I would have Chris Ann Hall's subscription immediately because – she could be your in-house constitution teacher and you just crank her up on the uh on the computer and let your kids be taught by a person that's been to law school not not a you know teachers are kind of multitasking when they teach all these different subjects say in grammar school or high school but chris ann hall is a a constitutional attorney that can uh get it on with your children and they would be the sharpest knives in the drawer when they go on to, say, college or whatever they're going to. So uh, she's got podcasts. She's got books. She's got uh, emails. She's got all kinds of stuff that, uh, like, for instance, here's one. America, are we now a, a guilty until proven innocent society, right? Uh And then another one, she's got a podcast, How Roy Moore and Al Franken Prove Our Congressman Unfit for Office. Right? Here's another one. Feds, Trump, and the Constitutional Standard. Another one, Your Questions on the Constitution. Uh, another one, Disenfranchi Disenfranchising the Voters. Uh, another one, constitutional sheriff in New Mexico defies the IRS. Uh, one thing about her, she's all over the country, and she's easy to understand. I've listened to her. In fact, I, I, uh, just t I've been benefiting from the five-day free trial, and I'm going to subscribe to her because I, I need her information. She knows so much more than I do, and I need all the help I can get. As I said earlier, I'm a slow learner. So I was noticing uh, on what she sent me in, in the email on, um, she said, Roy Trump, Roy Tr uh, Moore and Donald Trump proved three things. I want you to listen to this because everybody's got, they're all up in the air about Roy Moore. Well, let me help you here on this a little bit. First of all, uh, no one, one of the favorite things in politics, I've been fussing around with politics for many years. I started when I was in my early 30s working with a guy that did public relations and did campaigns and what would happen is right before the, right before an election newspapers uh do a deadline like they'll say you can't have any new ads after this deadline and what they're trying to do is is limit the amount of last minute hits where a person could allege something and you wouldn't have a chance to respond and uh, so they could allege anything it could be totally untrue 100 percent false and if it got out to the voters and a person didn't have a chance to really respond and clear that up they could very uh you could end up losing the election even though you were lied to you lied about and so it's a common ploy it's not new to this century uh it's been going on forever so She's, she makes some comments here about the Roy Moore and Donald Trump uh, elections. And let me just mention that before I get into this about Moore, he, he is a, a state senator uh, running for state senate in Alabama. He's not running for that in California or Nevada. And ultimately, it's people that are closest to him that will make the decision yay or nay, right? Not Washington, not Mitch McConnell not Ted Cruz, not anybody else, but Roy Moore's uh, constituents will make that decision. You remember the states of the Union were sovereign states before there was a country, right? Before there was a United States, there were individual sovereign states that were governing themselves, and they decided, let's work together, 
right? And they united, and they ended up calling that the United States. You know that? it didn't. The other one didn't come first. The United States didn't come before the states. The states came, and so the states make their own decisions. So we have some states that are really conservative, and we have some states that are really liberal, and if people like it, they can have it their way, right? Or if they don't like it, they can leave or they can change, change the state. So ultimately, it's Roy Moore's Alabamans who are going to size up Roy Moore and whether they believe these allegations or not. Now, the problem with allegations of this type, it's fascinating to me that Roy Moore has run for election many times before. He was an assistant district attorney. He ran for the highest court in the, in the state twice and actually was thrown out one was thrown out twice but the even after the first time he was thrown out because he he would not remove a big rock with the 10 commandments on it because he wouldn't do that he rejected the federal courts uh insistence on removing the 10 commandments he he was uh thrown out of office not by the population but but by mandate of government. And uh, so the voters voted him back in again. That's how, and that's the right we have at this. We have a lot of power at the state level. In fact, we have a lot of power at the county level. We can tell the state to go to hell. Did you know that? The, the county sheriff can tell the state to bug out. That's what uh, John D'Agostino did down here in El Dorado County when he told the Federal Forest Service to quit fussing and harassing El Dorado County citizens. And he took away their arresting power. He just said, you're not going to arrest anybody here. Just keep track of the chipmunks. Yeah, right? Uh, clean, keep, keep the roads clean. Mo you know, monitor the owls. But leave our people alone in El Dorado County. Or just go back to Washington, where you came from. You can do that. So, uh, anyway, let me read this: these three things that Chris Ann Hall, a specialist on the Constitution, has written. She said, number one, this is things we've learned with Roy Moore and Donald Trump. Elections have been manipulated and controlled for a very long time, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, we just have been studying and learning by the media. When the media admits something, that is huge because the media, as you know, is primarily fake news. They construct an, an, a reality that they want us to believe, but it's not really reality. So for the media to finally admit that the Democrat side of the last election was totally manipulated with Hillary Clinton winning uh, while Bernie Sanders really should have won. They manipulated it, and uh, she won in, uh, incorrectly. So Chris Ann's saying elections have been manipulated and controlled for a very long time, whether we want to admit it or not. Number two. The establishment powers are losing control. Now, when we think of the establishment, you've got to take the labels off, the Democrat-Republican labels. What we're seeing now is that Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and many others, including the Bush group, probably voted for Hillary Clinton. In fact, the Bushes admit they did not vote. George, George and George and Jeb did not vote for Trump. It doesn't bother me any. It just indicates where people's hearts are, right? So when you realize that a lot of the Republican establishment would rather have had Hillary because that would keep their status and their power intact rather than Trump, who would undermine their power. Remember the swamp concept came out of Trump. So she says, number two, she's talking about more and Trump. Establishment powers are losing control. Who do you think, if, if the establishment powers are losing control, who would be the people that are gaining more control? If you're thinking you and me, that would be correct. And when, that, when you and I have power, if that scares those in power, that's a, 
I want you to think about that. Our government was founded in such a way that the power they wanted the founders wanted the power to reside with the people, not with the government. So when the government is freaking out, it doesn't matter what label they are. You need to think about that because that means we we are upside down philosophically from what the founders thought. So Chris Ann Hall says, first, elections have been manipulated and controlled for a long time, whether we admit it or not. Number two, establishment powers are losing control. Number three, they don't like the people actually having their proper power over government. They are the establishment. That means people like Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, all these people that are in power, they love their power. They don't care what kind of government we have. They'll go along with a, a Democrat president. They don't care. They just love controlling everything. And that is totally opposite to what the founders thought. So Chris Ann Hall says, the establishment does not like people actually having their proper power and control over them. Think about it, she says. When have we seen this level of panic and activity in high-level politics? I'll answer that for you. Never. When have you seen people pour millions and millions of dollars to fight a candidate like Roy Moore? They spent millions of dollars. The Republicans fought. They don't want Roy Moore. Why, why, don't they, why wouldn't they want a Roy Moore? It has nothing to do with whether or not they didn't know anything about whether or not he was fussing around with girls. They didn't like the fact that he's a strict constitutionalist. They didn't like the fact that he's a Christian. They didn't like the fact that he's anti-Planned Parenthood. Do, do you notice that all these supposedly pro-life Republicans have not done Jack Diddley about removing funding from Planned Parenthood. Does that like ever get sink in over there at your place ever sink in? So if you see people saying, Oh yeah, I'm pro-life. Oh yeah, I'm pro-life. I'm, I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life. But they continue to vote for funding for Planned Parenthood. At some point you, you need to like, let that sink in. So she says, Chris Ann Hall says, um, seeing the people elect those who will not be controlled is scaring the power paradigm to death, she says. The power structure should be this terrified more often. Like, let's get it on. Let's just, like, have a total meltdown, right? They should even be more terrified than they are. If they were, it would be a sign that the people are actually in control of their representatives. Isn't it so interesting? I get a kick out of it. You know, I, every once in a while I'm in a meeting. I don't get out much, but once in a while I'm in a meeting, and there'll be some elected representatives there, and we just fret and fawn over these people. Oh, my God, assemblyman so-and-so's here, or congressman so-and-so, or senate so-and-so. I thought, they're just human beings. Like, let it go and all that stuff. They're supposed to be serving us instead of like, oh, can I, can I get you some food? Could I get you a cup of coffee? Could I, like, carry your bags for you? It's just like, hey, knock it off, why don't you? So Chris Ann Hall says, right now, the corrupt power moguls, that, peop that means people very powerful in control, and they like it. You know, people love being in control, control freaks, power freaks. These people are very powerful. You know, when you, you get off an elevator and people say, oh, Senator Ryan, oh, Senator, oh, Senator, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm meeting a senator. You know, it's an ego. It's a huge ego thing. Right now, the corrupt Senate, a corrupt power moguls still have hope. They can pull their dirty strings and make things happen, but they need to know with every move they make, they expose themselves for who they really are. Who are these people? They're corrupt. They're corrupt. Honestly, it's very difficult to find an, an honorable person serving at any, in any legislature uh, from California to Washington. They're corrupted. Money and power corrupt. Why do you think that the founding fathers said, we don't want, we know, we understand this corruption thing. It happens, right? And, uh, 
this thing, we don't want these people to be career government officials. No wonder they, they, they're not producing anything. They don't produce any goods and services that are helpful to us. All they do is, is take over more and more of our lives. So what, what Chris Ann Hall saying in this email to us today who were subscribing to her is what's this meltdown, this like top C, this uh, turmoil that's going on in our country is a good thing. She said it is not a bad thing. This is a healthy thing. This is what must happen if we were going to bring back our republic. We don't want democracy. We want a republic. Now, she says the people must, with bold cap letters, the people must be resolved to eliminate those political prostitutes and never let their kind back into power. These people are evil people. They are corrupt people. They are not interested in what's best for you. They're interested in what's best for them. Until you get that through your brain, you are constantly going to be sucker punched and deceived in this whole process. She says this could be the beginning of some great things. The future is in our hands. What will we do with it? Listen, I don't, I don't know Judge Roy Moore personally. I don't know any of these politicians personally. I know what when I see somebody make accusations at the very last minute in a campaign, that's of concern to me, particularly it's one thing if the person's never run for office. If I ran for office in this next go around here in Yuba County, I'm confident people will come out of the woodwork and have something to say about me, right? Which is fine, right? But, but when you got a guy like Roy Moore who has been in public office his entire life and who ran for the Supreme Court twice and nobody came forward, and I understand, I, I know women that have been, have been abused by local politicians in this, in this county, Yuba Sutter County, have been, they've come to me and said, I was molested by him when I was in high school. And please don't support him when you put out loose picks because I, I, I want you to know that because nobody knows that right i we tried to press charges but carl adams wouldn't press charges on him and he molested me in high school she won't come forward she won't go to she went to carl adams right she tried that i understand women don't have confidence in the system they will use the slut and nut a, a molester will use a slut and nut defense against uh against a woman that's been molested so i i know that's true i know it's hard to come forward but when people don't come forward until the last couple of weeks before you're going to be uh, in the uh the vote i i gotta wonder particularly when a whole bunch come and then all the republicans and the democrats come out against them are we need to take a break it, now we're going to need to take a break he says the time's up for this not i'm coming back for those who get freaked out last week we got an hour and a half to go We'll be right back. Well, uh, we're at the halfway point. If you're just stumbling across us, we're uh, the Patriot KMYC Radio, and this is Lou Benninger. This is a show we do every week on Saturday for three hours, nine to noon. And uh, so you can call in although we're not dependent on calling people because I got plenty to say myself. So if you want and it's convenient, we'll, we'll take your call. If not, if you're inconvenient, we're pro choicers out here. So we'll abort your call. Seven, four, two, 55, 55. Uh, I also want to mention that if you're new to this and you want to listen another time, Saturdays is kind of like a bummer time. People say, Lou, this is a terrible time to have a radio show. So I say, yeah, I know, you know, I agree. It's a terrible time for me too, because I'd rather be doing something else on Saturdays. So you can go to YouTube and type in one eye blind media and then click on playlists on that channel. And you can pick whichever show you want to listen to whenever you want to listen to it. If you're a middle of the night person, go for it. And, uh, 
so that's that. I was talking about the Roy Moore thing, and I just want, like I said uh, before we stopped here for the commercials, I don't know Roy Moore. I have watched his career for many years and agreed with uh, many of his actions that he has paid dearly for. To be thrown off the Supreme Court twice because of your stands on the Ten Commandments and stuff, most Christian people I know are spineless, and they they would not sacrifice their career or even 500 bucks out of their pocket for most causes. They just wouldn't. Uh, they're, they're afraid to speak out on almost anything, even going to the, to the polls and voting sometimes is a big, we have to push, push, push at church to get people to register to vote and just do their due diligence to be a citizen of this country, to put a sign in somebody's yard. And when they're standing up for some, I remember when prop eight, which was the, to, uh, reaffirm the definition of marriage. Oh my goodness. People paid a price. Some people did, uh, for standing up for marriage or donating towards the, that proposition. So, so it's no small thing when somebody people, say, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's just like, are you kidding me? He sacrificed his seat on the, on the uh, state of Alabama Supreme court. Like you think, a molester would do that. I don't know. I don't know what he, you know, I don't know what you do in your spare time. Most of us don't know what each other's, you know, we, we have a private life, right? I don't know what people do. I hope they do right. Right. You hope the best, but some people don't, right? We knew that right here. We, we have a district attorney who was corrupt, totally corrupt. In fact, it's to so corrupt that the supervisors weren't even willing to see how corrupt. In fact, they, People like James Gallagher, he wouldn't even make us. He's our assemblyman. He was on. He was on the. A, a lot of you love James Gallagher, assemblyman. He wouldn't even take a stand on the board of supervisors and on a totally corrupt misappropriation of funds, having sex with prostitutes. Honestly, man, you know, if people. You wonder when would a person actually say something and stand up? I had one supervisor say, "Well, what would you have done?" I thought, you know, something. I, I just thought honestly, people. When are leaders going to actually stand up for something? Well, a guy like Roy Moore actually stood up for something and cost him his occupation and career twice. That's amazing to me. And so in spite of you think, oh, if, you know, a lot of you think the government is good as gold. They aren't. You know, you think, you know, oh, well, if the government found him guilty, then he's guilty, guilty, guilty. Not necessarily not necessarily. And right now, when I see all these politicians united against more, I think I'm suspicious. In fact, there's an article. Uh, I don't know whether this is in on Breitbart or what, but it, it says, uh, they were having a discussion about the Roy Moore th situation. And, uh, and Steve Bannon asked, this, uh, oh, what's his name here? <clears throat> the guy's name is Ned Ryan. He's American majority founder. Yes. Ryan about, uh, Gloria Allred. If you, you've, you know, Gloria Allred, the female attorney who represents a lot of females, uh, when they have accusations against folks. So they were discussing this on a radio show. And, uh, so, she's now involved with, with this a lady or so involved in this Roy Moore ex accusation. So she shows up anytime there's accusation against politicians. So Ryan describes Allred as basically a human vulture. When you look back at some of the things she's been involved in. And so they say, remember the incident with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now I'm no Schwarzenegger fan. I never was. I never voted for him. I wanted Tom McClintock when they, when that recall election occurred, <clears throat> when Gray Davis was recalled, you remember that? <clears throat> and, and so everybody said, oh yeah, we love McClintock, but you know, he never can't, you know, he's not electable. People are not going to vote for him. So we didn't get him right. He went on to now he's in Congress. So Schwarzenegger, who was 
and probably still is an immoral guy. You remember he, he was what turned out what broke up his marriage uh, was the fact that he had sex with a housekeeper. Remember that? And, and produced a child with a housekeeper. And when that came out, that was the end of his marriage to Maria. However, when, you remember when he was running for office, there was this trail of women that came forward that said they were going to sue him, uh, and they were represented by Gloria Allred. So, great. I mean, I think, hey, sue him. Like, if you got something, let's go for it. I think I, I encourage women to come forward. You know, I've, I've encouraged the lady that I talked to that has accusation against a supervisor to come forward and file charges. And, but I understand where people don't want to be exposed. They'd rather just, uh, take their hurt and, and go on and the hurt of going through it all over again, maybe will be worse. I get it. But after the election of Schwarzenegger, none of these women filed charges. Now that's a concern to me because they now already exposed themselves to the public and came out with it. But they, they never followed through. Now, with more, you remember <clears throat> last week or the week before, they brought out this yearbook and uh, that supposedly was some sort of proof that he was immoral. But now they find out that the yearbook is a fraud and, this, and the handwriting's a fraud on it. And when they challenged... Gloria Allred, she has nothing to say in response. So to me, the whole thing uh, looks and smells like a political fiasco. Now, the reason is, listen, one of the, the most fascinating things for me on the Trump election was the fact that it exposed all these people's lies who said, oh, yeah, I stand for this, I stand for that, I stand for this, I stand for that. No, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. And all it was is rhetoric. They really never planned to follow through on anything because once they got everything they wanted, which was Republican control of the House, Republican control of the Senate, and a, a more conservative fellow in the White House, can't even get Obamacare turned around. You know, maybe they'll get tax reform, maybe they won't. But so many things, oh, we're going to we're gonna eliminate Planned Parenthood. We're going to do this. We're, they don't do anything. We just have people in power that want to keep power. That's what we've got. And until you, like, get that through your skull, you're going to be tossed to and fro, back and forth. The Bible says to and fro. That's the only people that use that language is the Bible. Fro, F-R-O, or Afro. Fro. That's here and there. You're just going to toss to and fro because you can't, you don't know what's shaking. So people are always jacking you around. So uh, my what my hope is is that more more wins, and and I my hope is that these women have been violated. They file they file an action against him. Just like these women are coming out against Franken, and against all kinds of people against Mendoza down here, uh, Assemblyman Mendoza or Senator Mendoza down here in the state of California. People are, women now are lining up coming out against Mendoza. And, and I think there's going to be more and more people, women are coming out because they feel emboldened that this is encouraged and supported now. And they're going to, they're going to get the proper support and representation, uh, and help with the district attorney's offices. So my, my encouragement is, hey, they, I, I'm not going to be voting in the more election, but I'll tell you uh, what Moore is going to do when he gets to the, the Senate is he's going to be a, another Trump uh, at, back in Washington, and they don't want that. I don't care whether it's Moore or Adams or Smith or Jones. They're going to – McConnell and his people are having a really unhappy time. And my feeling is those women, if there's, if they got the goods on Mr. Moore and they just put it off for 40 years of coming forward, hey, take him down now. Uh, and, you know, because you're going to get all the support of the Democrats and the uh, Republic Republicrats, as I call them. So that's enough on that. Uh, let's see. I wanted to talk about 
these guys, uh, man, there is so many just wild things going on. It's did you did you notice? This is unbelievable. You know the Make America Great Again campaign that people just want to write off as fluff. Would you have believed you would ever be seeing this? And, of course, the Democrats, it doesn't matter how good things get in any area of our society right now. The Democrats just want to impeach the president, right? That's the goal. So 13 states this year have seen their unemployment rates drop to the lowest level, not since Bush or not since Reagan, ever recorded since the federal government began keeping track of data. Is that unbelievable? I, I can't even believe I'm reading this and saying it. 13 states, eight years after we hit bottom of the worst recession in modern history, states having economic booms range from the bluest states in the country like Hawaii and California, to the reddest states, Idaho and Texas. <clears throat> in October, the unemployment rates in Al Alabama, Hawaii, Maine, Mississippi, Mississippi, it's the poorest state in the Union, Mississippi, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington all met or beat their lowest rates ever recorded by the Bureau of Labor Statistics ever, all the way going back to Adam and Eve. Just hold that thought. <clears throat> Colorado, California, Idaho, North Dakota, and Oregon also hit new lows earlier this year. That's a, is that amazing? And, and you know what's amazing about it, what I, what I love about it, is those are real people going to work and making money for their families. I, I love it when people get a job, when they've been unemployed and they've been struggling for so long, or people get off welfare and they get a job and the thrill of getting a job and coming home and dressing up and going to work and taking care of their kids. They, you know, they feel proud of that. That's awesome. I just, that's what makes it for me is it seeing people able to buy a house or buy a car or whatever they want to do, take care of their children, buy clothes for their kids, put them in soccer, get them, get them going. Uh, oh, by the way, let me mention this with all the Roy Moore stink. I, I wonder if you notice this, you may have missed this, uh, has this been on all the channels? Uh, let's see. I'm going to, I'm trying to look for this guy's name. David Alcorn. Have you heard about him? You haven't heard about him? Uh, well, David Alcorn, I think he's a candidate for Congress in New Mexico. Well, you haven't heard about him. He hasn't been right next to Roy Moore. Well, he's he's running for Congress. And uh, in the, yeah, second district of New Mexico. And he made the local news re recently back there in New Mexico. I just I was down there in Albuquerque a couple years ago. And uh, Alcorn's running for Congress. And he made the local news when a warrant was issued for him for allegedly stalking a woman. Currently. Right? The woman attended a Halloween party at a hotel in Santa Fe on October 28th. That's of this year. Not like back in 1970 or something. Said, she said she started receiving persistent text messages from Alcorn, one, of the, one with a picture of his genitals. Well, I, see that? Now we've got the copycat from mr weiner back there and you wonder who how many people you influence in this world there you go right there alcorn has got the weiner complex and so he sent a picture of the genitals over there to that lady and um and he suggested he, he was watching her and professing his love for her now i don't know i thought you just brought a rose or some roses sent a rose instead of your genitals over to a gal that i'm too old-fashioned right i thought oh if i'd have known that maybe i could get a date if i just sent a, a picture of my genitals over instead of the roses i thought i wonder whether flowers didn't work anymore 
just send a package of your junk over there. I thought, well, I've been, nobody told me that. I didn't get enough sex ed. My parents would never told me all the things. I never got enough edge. I tell you, I'm a slow learner. This, I, that this genital thing must work nowadays. So the woman said later that that night he texted her that he was right outside her apartment. This is a congressional candidate. And is the media catching on to this? No, no, no. Cause he's a Democrat and he fits more into Washington than a guy like Roy Moore. Santa Fe police issued a warrant for his arrest on October 30, but he failed to turn himself in. Now that's a, that's a real honorable <laughs> congressional candidate. He said, no, nah, not going to do that. I'm going to run for Congress and I don't have time to turn myself in to the police. So Albuquerque, there you go. That's where I was. I was in Albuquerque. I spent the night down there checking, uh, meeting up with some people we work with in Vietnam and, uh, Albuquerque police finally arrested him at the Via de San, you, you gotta be Mexican to say this Via de San Felipe apartments, a, gr a good gringo can't even talk that right there. And, uh, so they arrested him at those apartments, those Mexican apartments, when they were called there for a welfare check on Friday, November 10th. It was unclear that he, he was, what he was even doing there. Police didn't get into the details, but he's, he's not facing any additional charges from Albuquerque. His campaign has not commented on the story as of yet. Now you would think they'd comment on it, but here's the kicker. He was previously convicted. Now this is, this isn't some lady again. I'm not, I don't know Roy Moore and I'm hoping he didn't do any of those things. Right. I don't wish anybody, whether a Democrat or Republican, I do not wish bad things on people or wish they die or get hit by a car or whatever. But this is interesting when the, the news won't pick this up. This gentleman, Mr. Alcorn who is being accused of being a stalker and sending photos of his privates to women to introduce himself. He was previously convicted of aggrav aggravated stalking a woman in 2007. Now that isn't in 1970. That's 2007. At that time, the deputy DA in charge of the case said Alcorn was previously convicted of domestic violence, battery, assault, and violation of a restraining order. Now, listen, folks, if you're not hearing that on the news and you got every Republican, not every Republican, but lots of Republicans and all these Democrats, just their hairs on fire and they're saying stuff like we won't, uh, have you heard him said, was that Schumer that said, we're not going to allow Roy Moore to serve. That's you can't do that. In fact, Chris Ann Hall constitution specialist said there's there's nothing in the law that says you can forbid a person from serving if the people of his state elect him he's going to serve as long as he's in there now i want to tell you some about somebody said to me last week i forget what i was talking about i was talking about all these people that were uh immoral in office and she said lou you didn't talk about harvey milk and i thought Oh, I like to talk about Harvey Milk because this is such a sign of such immorality and corruption. So do you remember how Barack Obama uh, chose, remember he invited Dan Savage. You remember Dan Savage where he, he was hoping all Christians would die. He's a homosexual man man boy guy he likes to have sex with boys dan savage he invited uh christian hating homosexual dan savage to the white house he says all oh, matter of, he, he gets really dirty talking uh in public remember obama invited he had him at the white house and uh, you remember the safe schools are for obama was a homosexual founder of the gay lesbian and straight education network called gleason g-l-s-e-n that's kevin jennings and they had him there until they prove that he was, uh, I don't know what they think these people are. And finally they put so much pressure that this guy, uh, was so corrupt. Kevin Jennings, they finally got rid of him, but Obama awarded a presidential medal of freedom. Uh, posthumously 
In other words, after he died. In other words, Harvey Milk had died in the 70s, right? But Obama, he, he couldn't let him rest peacefully. He had to bring him back to give him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And, uh, and then Hollywood, they deified him. They made him a god. They made him the homosexual Martin Luther King when they made the film Milk. Now, I didn't go to see it because I didn't want to invest my money and such lies and perversion. Now, on May 22nd of every year, our corrupt and perverted sexual perverts down there in Sacramento that run this state, they have designated May 22nd as Harvey Milk Day. <clears throat> and it's another abuse of our public schools to advance the moral corruption of homosexuals and their ideological agenda and um, so it happened right under uh, the guy some of you Republicans voted for Arnold Schwarzenegger he signed it into law that was SB 572 this law introduced it was introduced by Mark Leno L-E-N-O who was one of the very outspoken homosexual uh, senators in Sacramento at that time and uh, he said this law will have special significance in the public schools and educational institutions and would encourage those entities to conduct suitable commemorative exercises on that date. So this is to K through 12, all the way through school. And um, so it's, it's interesting. Milk, you know, was in office less than a year. Did you know that? And he was only in San Francisco seven years. And the guy was a prolific liar. He lied about his service in the military. He got an honorable discharge from the military from and the Navy, serving four years. But he, you know, uh, homosexuals tend to portray themselves as victims. And so he said he was kicked out of the military because he's a homosexual. But he lied. And then he lied about his, his he ran for supervisor multiple times and was defeated. But he, and the, the one when he actually was elected, he firebombed his own camera shop and then portrayed it that he was being assaulted. And so it, it helped him get some votes. And um, so he's really famous for winning one election, serving less than one year, and then getting himself murdered. Uh, and he, he celebrated having sex with other men. But he really didn't like to have sex with men. Most sexual men as men get older, they have the same problem. All of us do. As you get older, you lose your attraction to the opposite sex. Well, for older men, older homosexual men, many times they end their life because, you know, you can always pick up a younger guy. So he just, he started out with younger guys and he just stuck with that. And he had sex with boys that were under 18. Now it's interesting that sometimes the government arrests you for having sex with underage kids. And then at other times, they make a holiday for you. Is that amazing? So uh, so people around here, most people, like if you get contrary with the sheriff's department, you know, uh, and Pat McGrath, uh, district attorney for Yuba County, they'll be arresting you if you have sex with an underage boy or girl. But if you have it in, in just certain ways and you're a big shot like Melk became and he was a big guy and he was too big, you know, what did they say? Uh, what, what did Bush say about the banks when he f funded the banks? They were too big to lose or too big. What was the term? Too big to something to fail. Too big to fail. Too big to fail. So Melk became too big to fail because he was a, a, a big a poster boy, poster guy for the homosexuals on Castro Street. And so it was okay for him. They call it in. And they say in the dictionary, pederasty, right? Pederast. He was a pederast. P-E-D-E-R-A-S-T, I think it is. You can look it up. So and those are men that, that they have a particular lust towards young boys. That was Harvey Milk. And today, you would think that parents would line up at the public school saying, hell no. But no, they don't. They just accept it. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Y'all are not going to believe what I'm about to tell y'all. And oh, it's like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Guess who GQ named Citizen of the Year? Not one of our Hurricane Harvey heroes. Nope. Not one of our soldiers who put their lives on the line every day. Nope. They named Colin Kaepernick Citizen of the Year. Yeah, y'all heard me right. They named Colin Kaepernick Citizen of the Year out of all the people in the world. GQ, y'all tripping. Y'all need to go to bed. Colin Kaepernick ain't nothing but a little crybaby black white girl with a nappy afro pup that's always whining, complaining, and race baiting. So I'm trying to figure out how y'all came up with that conclusion, huh? All he did was take a knee and make a million dollars while disrespecting the people who fought and died for this country while disrespecting law enforcement as a whole. Yes, it's okay to talk about a bad police officer, but when you disrespect law enforcement as a whole, you are disrespecting the good ones. You are disrespecting the ones who protect spoiled millionaires like you. So GQ, y'all tripping. GQ, I thought y'all were better than this. I thought y'all were at least going to choose one of our Hurricane Harvey heroes. Some of the people who spend day and night in Houston, Texas, saving people from the flood. Some of the people who spend weeks and weeks in Houston helping people. Oh, I thought y'all were at least going to choose one of our soldiers that wake up every morning and put their life on the line for America. But no, y'all chose a fake Phony wanna be Martin Luther King. A fake phony wanna be Malcolm X. Y'all chose a spoiled rich brat. I just feel like we need to clean up some unforced errors. That's it. I mean, I walk out on stage and my mic's not on. I mean, that's just a simple thing we talk about in staff meetings and we practice during the week and then on Sundays we can just can't perform. I mean, I don't know what you more you want me to do. I feel like I close my sermons the same way every Sunday. As I close, the worship team is going to come out. Does the worship team come out? No. I feel like I finished strong, honestly. I just got to get back and take a look at some of the film, get some things for my sermon corrected for next week. I mean, attendance was down, so I feel like that hurt my confidence a little bit coming out of the gate. But I mean, from a number standpoint, we did okay. Looks like we got uh, five applause breaks. We got three amens and one mm, preach. So like, I mean, from a numbers game, I feel like we're doing well. I just got to do a better job. I mean, I'll take responsibility for my sermon. It wasn't the best thing I've ever done. I had a hilarious story about my kids to start, but then honestly, the scriptural tie-in was not great. I mean, I'm just not comfortable performing in this system. We're doing an eight week sermon series. Honestly, it should have wrapped up at about five. We're doing this like Stranger Things spinoff called Jesus is a Life Changer Things. Yeah, grammatically, it literally doesn't even make any sense. I mean, I'm a little banged up. I got a sore throat. I'm not 100% either, but I don't, I no excuses. I knew I needed to come out here and perform on Sunday. I mean, who else is going to preach? The youth pastor? Absolutely not. I mean, last time I had that guy preach, he was quoting Chance the Rapper lyrics. I mean, we just can't have that. I mean, we're, we're doing a good job as a team getting plenty of people to come forward for prayer. We're just not getting salvations. We're not getting the conversions when we need to, bottom line. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll take those now. Just slip your hand up all over this room. Yes, 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 yes. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're uh, getting close to the runway here. We got an hour to go. You're listening to Live with Lou. I wanted to mention again a couple of our sponsors. We at the uh, want you to think about going over to the Tea Party meeting for the Sutter Buttes Tea Party Patriots at Glad Tidings uh, campus on Highway 99 at Eager Road at 6.30 Monday night. And if you would like to learn really quickly how to prepare your family for an emergency, uh, you should check that out. Uh, I put on one when I was still working at Glad Tidings. I tag team with the Mormons, and we put on one together at Glad Tidings, and it was so fascinating. Talked about organizing, like, how you're going to communicate we got when you're at work your wife's at work your kids are somewhere else to where you're going to rendezvous if something happened in the city where you would maybe at all if you couldn't communicate where you would all head to a common spot 
just really cool stuff you really haven't thought about, but you might uh, need to have something in organized because we're not, you know, it'd be easy if we all did everything together, but we scatter every morning and we kind of come together at night. And so what would happen if something went down while you're all scattered? What would you know how to do if communication went down? So there's a lot of cool things. So they got Jason Reichard coming there uh, Monday night at uh, Glad Tidings in Yuba City to talk about emergency preparedness. Should be a great night, and so check it out. You don't have to be a member or anything. They just meet, and uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is Elite Security, and they are sponsoring us here, and they have some very cool uh, courses that you can take. And if you have any, if you just need a job, they will hire you if you if you go out there and they you look good and you want to get involved with the security business law enforcement the beginnings of law enforcement maybe you just want to get started and you can dial them up at 7490280 elite security they're much bigger than what you would think of just a typical security company but they have all kinds of classes in this what they call the API academy <clears throat> And it's kind of like a, uh, a private police academy in that sense. They teach a lot of skills that you're going to need in law enforcement, but whether or not you go into full-blown law enforcement or not. So everything from pepper spray, pepper spray handcuff training, taser training, de-escalation of force training, uh, security guard training, lots of classes you can take. You can start t taking them and get involved out there. You can get a job when you're 18 years of age. That's a lot sooner than you can uh, do in law enforcement. You have to be 21 to be a police officer or correctional officer. So they'll get you started. So uh, they're located right here in Yuba County, but they also have uh, jobs up in Chico and Redding. And they, you know, Monty Hecker told me this week, he sent me an email. I said, Lou, tell them there's jobs. We got jobs available. So go to work. Like Terrence earlier said, go to work. So check it out, and uh, we appreciate their support. And I want to get back here to talking about, if I can find it here, uh, it's right in the middle. Look back for this Harvey Milk. Well, let me tell you a little bit about, finish up with Harvey Milk. The senators and assemblymen in Sacramento voted to have May 22nd, uh, forcing our public schools to honor him uh, every year. Let me see. Okay, I'm almost there. So, uh, and then they uh, Hollywood created a, a film honoring Harvey Milk called Milk, and then President Obama uh, awarded him a Medal of Freedom. It's just, it's just looks un unbelievable to me that they would do such a thing. So these are some of the things they left out. <clears throat> Nine days, uh, let me just say this, that Melk was killed along with the mayor of the city of, of uh, San Francisco, a guy named George Moscone. They were killed uh, one after another. And so the way the homosexuals and the film portrayed it is that they were killed because uh, Danny White, who was a supervisor who shot them, was anti-homosexual, which was 100% false. Danny Melk uh, was not anti-homosexual. He'd actually donated to homosexual causes. And uh, it, it was all about a political issue that White had got frustrated, quit the Board of Supervisors, and then a few days later decided he made a mistake. So he asked George Moscone to reappoint him, which George Moscone was uh going to do and milk then didn't want him appointed and leaned on Moscone to not appoint him and when that didn't happen danny white realized what had happened and shot them both but the interesting thing that is left out of all this is nine days before milk's death more than 900 followers of jim jones and people's temple uh died in a murder-suicide 
and that's where we talk about drinking the Kool-Aid. Jim Jones gave all of his people something to drink, and it killed them. They died poisoned to death down in Ghana. And um, before they drank the deadly Kool-Aid, Harvey Milk and much of San Francisco's ruling class, their politicos, who's who in San Francisco, uh, they were all behind Jones. They thought he was Jim Jones. He was a corrupted guy that ran, quote, I put quotes around the term church when I use Jones' name. There was all kinds of corrupt and immoral stuff going on in that church. And, but they all promoted Jones. He was a big national uh, figure through newspaper columns and defended people's temple from more and more. They kept accumulating critics. Uh, Jones actually helped recruit volunteers for, for Harvey Milk's campaigns, distributed leaflets for him by the tens of thousands. Milk returned the favor by abusing his position of public trust on behalf of Jones' criminal endeavors. One of uh, Jones was, uh, let me just say that Jones, Reverend Jim Jones, they called him, was widely known in the minority communities in San Francisco and the Bay Area uh, as a man of high character. How many people have we seen in religious circles were portrayed as people of high character that weren't? And so uh, there was a situation with a young boy that uh, Jones got placed in custody of their church with a family. It was taken away from his parents, and there began a battle ensued over this six-year-old boy. And uh, Melk wrote the President of the United States, President Jimmy Carter, and endorsed uh, Mr and Mrs. Jones as loving and protective parents. And uh, <clears throat> I said that they, they eventually went to Ghana. They actually went to Guyana, which is a slightly different country. And uh, so anyway, uh, Melk interceded for Jones because many of the kids that were a part of that people's temple had actually been foster kids isn't that amazing so john stone was a boy um, whose actual parents milk libeled to the president of the united states as per as purveyors of bull-faced lies in other words he said john stone who's a youngster milk said his parents were liars and um, that the boy should be left with the jo jones people so John Stone, along with 900, about 900 followers of Jim Jones, went to Guyana. And once they got down there, Jim Jones had this concept that they should all die. And they all took Kool-Aid together that was laced with poison, and they died. That was conveniently left out of Melk's uh, Freedom Medal discussion out of the movie and out of the award of a holiday where all of our public education students must be taught that M milk is the Martin Luther King of homosexuality and we and you may be a homosexual yourself you never know you just uh, you know it, it you know it's up to God you, God just created to one way or the other and uh, all this baloney and so Milk, but they won't talk about the fact that milk. You see, it's interesting how there's, you can see this clouding of having sex with children that's going on in our society. You think, oh, right now, you know, women are coming out and standing up for righteousness and finally coming out. You know, really, our society is totally corrupted. And uh, it's interesting, we just protested uh, a rapist that was uh, placed out in District 10 in, in North Yuba County, a serial rapist who was released from prison. We make a big deal about that, but then we actually don't protest May 22nd, Harvey Milk Day in our public schools, and we just turn our head and, or turn a blind eye, as they say, to a guy who admitted 
and was not shy about the fact that he had sex with 15, 16 year old boys. That was his preferred target audience. You think, oh, this is a great, great deal. I don't know why we just don't change the law then and make sex with children okay. Why don't we do that? There's lots of people that want want that or have sex with animals or whatever. Like, let's just go for it. So uh, it's just, it just kind of an amazing, twisted phenomena. Now, the other thing that I thought was fascinating is that we have three UCLA basketball players that went to China. And um, I am not, I have never subscribed to the fact that blacks are less intelligent than whites. That would be your university professors who believe in evolution, who taught from the 19, when I ended up in college for a short period of time before I dropped out, they taught us that we all evolved from monkeys. When I say that to people nowadays, they always laugh at me. I don't know why. That I'm just telling you, you had to pay to go to school to te- have them tell you that. They told me that at Marisol High School. Then when I got over to Sac State, they told me that in the anthropology class. So we came from monkeys, and some people evolved quicker and f- better than other groups. And the in- inflection was that blacks did not advance as quickly and we're not as intelligent and so we couldn't expect as much from blacks so therefore we had to make allowances for blacks because they just weren't you know they were a little intellectually rough around the edges that's what they taught us i'm not saying i believe that in my home where i was raised it was not a christian home we were taught people were people we love people right we just respect people we weren't like we weren't like big spiritual people in my family but we're just taught basic stuff people are people you just like hey it's all cool so when i played basketball we had a mixed multitude on our team and uh of of different flavors and we all had a happy experience together but now we have three well these are used to listen if you get to play basketball for a, a college like ucla you've accomplished something right you're the best of the best in the country so these guys go to China with other teams to do play over there. And um, so we have three basketball players that go into multiple stores. Like if you go to China and you go out to the rural area, they got people eat, living on dirt floors, right? Eating, eating off open fires. If you go to downtown Beijing or Guangzhou or Shanghai, Nanjing, uh, you're going to see high rises in some of the fanciest, most expensive stores, just like you would if you went to Los Angeles and New York, right? So, Leangelo Ball, the brother of Lonzo Ball, that's playing for the Los Angeles Lakers, the son of LeVar Ball, who's an idiot, uh, and Jalen Hill and Cody Riley went to multiple high profile, expensive stores and stole stuff. They say, oh, they just stole sunglasses. But they were, uh, I don't know why they didn't arrest them right then, but they they watched them steal. Now, if the thing to do, you don't want to go to China and steal stuff. You're better off trying another country because they you don't necessarily get a trial. And this is where Mr. Laval Ball, the, the father of these boys, he's got three or four boys. That guy is a flat-out idiot because if you want to, get incarcerated in China, they will use you to sell your body parts to foreigners that need a kidney or a, or a liver. And they'll just tell you that you got pneumonia and died. Uh, your kid died and send the clothes home for you. That's it. That's China. There isn't no human rights over there. So this LeVar Ball, I don't think he could find his way to China if he had to, the father. So they arrest these guys, and and now it's amazing to me. If Trump, Trump had this Asian trip planned, if he would have gone to China and not done anything about those three boys, all hell would have broke loose in the media. But since he 
did do something about the boys and got them released, it's still hell in the media, right? And so uh, those guys got arrested. Now, l let me tell you something. Most of you just have not had the opportunity to get out much. When you travel to other countries, it really helps you understand what you ought to be fighting for here at home because we got some stupid people here in America that have had it too easy for too long. That includes a lot of black people, include Mr. Ball. And uh, he is the uh, – what he is good at is trash talk. So recently he was like minimizing – and disrespecting the president of the United States. Now, I wish we could say a lot of good things about Barack Obama, how he got hostages released and how he did all wonderful things, but he just didn't do that kind of stuff. Do you remember the guy that got beat to death over there in uh, North Korea? They brought, they finally sent him home and he died here at home. He was a top student for one of the Ivy league colleges and went on a education experience over there and took a, a banner down for a souvenir and and they they sent him home to die i mean they beat the kid to death uh, honestly people these college students over here they done mess with the wrong people you do not want to steal stuff in china or going over there and violating the law because uh you will get uh you will get in trouble over there if you want to read a great book that will just scare the hell out of you on what's going on in China, it's a book called The Slaughter, and the guy's name is Gutman, G-U-T-T-M-A-N. Uh, that's a I, – I got that book. I saw he written, wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal. I ordered the book, and I just, I just couldn't put it down because I knew – I knew I go there. I've been there more times than I can remember. I'd have to count my passport the amount of times I've been in and out of China. And when you go to a communist country, there's military people. You don't see you don't see them. They're not always dressed military. There's people watching everybody all the time. They got they got hotel rooms bugged. It's a different world, right? Uh, it's safer than the United States in terms of criminal stuff. I'm, I feel safer in Vietnam and China than I do here, but you don't want to go over there and commit a crime or get sideways uh, with them. So anyway, President Trump goes over there to meet with the president of China, and he gets these guys sprung free. Now, it's interesting. They went on television and were kind, speaking, and polite to the Chinese. Now, those guys, you've seen these these idiots playing for these professional teams when they're speaking after a, a game they act like juveniles uh these boys were respectful talking and uh but you does not doesn't it give you pause where guys are playing they're some of the best athletes in the country you talk about spoiled no discipline and no character and they go to these kids are not 13 they're in their 20s and they're playing the top teams in the United States, and they go to a foreign country and steal from it. It's like, is that embarrassing to you? That's embarrassing to me. When I see Westerners, when I'm in Vietnam, and I see Westerners misbehaving, like from the United States, or they may even be from Europe, it's embarrassing to me. I said, these people are just like idiots, just because they have money, right, or they live in America. They didn't, they didn't help create America. They're not, bit, they're not contributing to America. They're just like coasting and collecting money off everybody and go to a foreign country and act like they're all something and everything. It's just like disgusting. People are disgusting. This, this Ball family, man, they got a long way to go. This, they got, I feel sorry for the Lakers. This guy can play basketball, but this guy's live. You know, so many of these guys just crash and burn. What's the problem? It's a character issue, right? Same problems we have in politics. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention the guys, you know, in the previous show, uh, Randy or, or uh, Andy Vasquez and Mike Leahy got to talking at the last there about a need, needing a place for seniors. You know something? 
does it ever, you ever notice how government just thinks they need to fix everything? Like, oh my God, the kids don't have any place to play. The seniors don't have any place to play. We need, you know, they never say, I didn't hear Andy say, I'm going to take my money and buy him a place. Or Mike Leahy say, I'm going to take my money and buy him a place. No, the first thing is, say, oh, we're going to, we're going to solve this problem. Talk really big. And then they say, and we're going to use money from Lou, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're going to use money from, we're going to take money from the taxpayers and we're going to solve the world's problem. I said, why don't you leave the money with the taxpayers and don't worry about the seniors, right? And if, and if we, as a people in the community gets concerned about the seniors, maybe we'll do that. Right. So we got a break coming. So we got a break and we're going to be, we got 30 more minutes, but don't leave. We're coming back for 30 minutes. That's a sign to you to stick around. Every church can prevent a massacre like the one in Texas. I'm Randy Thomason with your SaveCalifornia.com Minute. A local church's congregation needs protection. True shepherds will recognize this real-life need. Bottom line, pastors need to accept the fact that one or two trained armed men are needed at every congregational meeting. Avoiding or opposing this, as Jesus Christ taught, is the equivalent of a bad shepherd running away when the wolf arrives, because a hired hand does not care about the sheep. So if you don't want people in your church murdered by some demon-inspired killer, take this easy step. Go to SaveCalifornia.com for our fact sheet, How Every Church Can Prevent a Massacre, and share it with your pastor. Because biblical love is the heart of Christianity. SaveCalifornia.com, fighting the good fight for your values in California. Politics, not content of character, dictates how black Americans are treated by the left. Exposing lies, revealing truth. Here's the deal with Deneen Borelli. Black conservatives get the harshest treatment. Trust me, I've heard them all. Uncle Tom, Auntie Tom, Traitor, Oreo, the Negro Please Award. Then there are the threats. If I ever see you, I'ma beat you up. And you need to be with a two by four, you racist pig. And you a sellout. Same skin color, but liberal blacks are worshiped by the left. Former President Obama's hope and change. Obama, Obama, Obama. Maxine Waters. This is your time. So I'm claiming my time. And I want you to claim your time. Even take a knee, Colin Kaepernick is put on a pedestal and gets the 2017 GQ Citizen of the Year Award. Here's the deal. I'm an independent thinker with strong beliefs. Beliefs that are not for sale. I won't censor myself to score an invitation to drink cocktails with the liberal DC elite, to be honored by the Hollywood elite or liberal black publications. Not this girl. I won't shut up to make Democrats feel better about their failed policies. I won't be intimidated into silence by people who think I'm too stupid to get an ID to vote. And I will never, ever trade my freedom for the liberal plantation. All right, Uh, we're uh, into our last few minutes today. I wanted to, I was touching on this Yuba County seniors uh, in Yuba, in the Yuba Sutter area, but it's really Yuba County. And I was talking about supervisor Vasquez and supervisor Leahy that were in here doing a show with uh, city council person, 
of Marysville, Stephanie McKenzie, before I came on. And they got to talking about the senior center. And, you know, uh, Andy, uh, when I just took a break, uh, Andy Vasquez, is a supervisor for Linda District 1, passed through, and he'd been listening to the show, I guess. And he said, hey, Lou, uh, I, I am not in, endorsing or uh, wanting the government to meet the needs of the seniors. He said, I, I just said, hey, they need to f- sit down and resolve their <clears throat> plans and future and solutions and problems on their own as a group if they want to be a group. And I said, oh, way to go, Andy. So here's the deal. There's there's a editorial in the Appeal Democrat, which is a paper that <clears> – <throat> a daily paper here in the Yuba Sutter County area. And it says, our view – Yuba County seniors need some place that they can call home. And then the, the lead line in this article says, for crying out loud, couldn't we as a community come up with some solution for the Yuba County Senior Center problem? Now, he, here's what, when that phrase is stated like that, most people say, well, what's government going to do then, right? Right. Now, I don't know what the Peel Democrat was thinking, but in the past, there's been this thing that somehow it's just like typical entitlement mentality. If there's a need, government needs to fill it. And that's what socialism is all about. In other words, you give all your money or give large percentages of your money to government. In California, when you add up all your taxes, fees, permits, all the junk, daily taxes over everything you do, you're paying over 50% of your money into government, maybe 60 or 70%. When you add up everything, DMV fees, sales taxes, taxes on your phone, taxes on your utilities, everything. So we're giving all this money to government. Then whenever you have a need, you just go to government. I was just talking to, to the jail inmates at Yuba County, and I said, hey, we are talking about smoking and taking care of yourself, nutrition. I said, hey, you guys that want the government to go fix your lung or fix your throat or fix this, pay for this, pay for that, do this, do that, they're going to tell you what to eat eventually. They're going to tell you what you can smoke, what you can drink. And they're going to tell you you can't have any of that anymore, right? They're going to eliminate that because, uh, because they're picking up the tab for you in every turn. I said, if you want freedom, then you gotta you got to behave yourself and pay for your own screwiness if you – ruin yourself you need to pay the penalty so this whole thing of like somehow somebody wants a senior center or some kind of center and all of a sudden the government's got to pay for it is malarkey it's it's totally screwed up the same thing i've been saying about the homeless the government needs to get out of the charity business listen just provide us police and fire and keep the roads and the, and the drainage and some of those big things taking care of the infrastructure and leave all the re- leave all the rest of the tax money with the people and we will take care of the thing ourselves. We do not need your help at figuring out how to be kind to somebody. Government is the least kind institution in the country. I can I'm a better judge of whether my neighbor needs my charity or not than the supervisors are or the CAO of the county. So this thing of like I was on the school board, Yuba County Office of Education, when when we rented that building to the seniors. And and I was on the school board when we decided we didn't need that building anymore. We originally Rick T. Garden, the superintendent, bought that thinking we would use that because it was available. It was empty. It was falling apart. He bought it thinking we could use that as a education center and we ended up renting it out to the seniors in the meantime and it didn't ever develop so into anything else. So finally the Yuba County Office of Education being good stewards of the people's money, we had a number of people pieces of property in the two in the uh, not two counties but the Oliver Salinda area in Marysville that we didn't need anymore. That's a good being a good steward. The problem is government like California, if they'd sell off all the surplus government property, we maybe could reduce our taxes. Same way with the feds. They got property all over that they own that should be turned back to the people. Say, so at, at Yuba County Office of Education, we decided, hey, we aren't using these pieces of property for education. That's what we're here for. 
let's sell it and use the money for education, right? So all of a sudden, people get all up in arms. Oh, my God, including the newspaper saying, you're, you're doing the seniors wrong. Listen, we don't owe anything to the seniors. The county doesn't owe anything. The government doesn't owe anything to the seniors. And the seniors don't owe anything to the government. It shouldn't be that way. The seniors of all people in our community are some of the brightest and some of the best managers of their life there are in our co in, in our community. The young people, the 20s and 30-somethings, are the ones that are screwed up and, and going bankrupt and making stupid decisions of their life, sleeping around, switching partners and doing stupid stuff. Seniors have got all the way through that. And it doesn't mean every se senior's rich. But honestly, I do a lot of work with people that are seniors that are volunteers, people that have degrees and all kinds of stuff that are attorneys, social workers, tax specialists that are now not working for a living, but are retired. They did not give up their brain when they retired. It's like of all the people in our community that should be able to figure out how to, if they, you know, to me, I wouldn't even attend a senior center, right? Because I'm involved in activities all the time with people of all ages, seniors all the way down to kids in juvenile hall. So I'm involved. You know, we all have activities we're involved in. I go to church. That's sort of a senior senator. I mean, there's, there's seniors in there. They, could, they can have activities there if they want. I get it. Not all people want to go to church. It's fine. But they could be involved in all kinds of things if they wanted to. But to say we want our own building to do our own thing in, that's totally cool. In America, you can do that. All they have to do is find one, rent one. They don't have to have all us young 30, 40, 50-year-old people scurrying around. Oh, my God, gr these people want a senior center. We have to go find it. Come on. Well, you, if, if that's all you can do as a supervisor, you need to go find another job. We don't need you for that. And what Andy was just saying as he walked through the lobby here at break, he said, Lou, they have money in the bank. All they have to do is sit down. If they have a board of directors and they want to have a nonprofit, they have to decide, we'll rent here. We'll keep earning. You know, they make money off bingo or whatever they make money off to pay their way. If they ever want to build a building, one year a, cup, a guy that had money just donated and paid their rent for them. Uh, so it's like, Hey, you know, Americans that accumulate lots of money when they die, if they don't have kids to leave it to, they could fund a senior center and build it and let them run it. Why would we have to worry about that? We shouldn't have to worry about every church in town or every group in town. Oh my God, they're, 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 they're this, they're that. Hey, if people want to support it, to support it, they don't, it'll go by the wayside and we'll do without that. Right. But this whole thing of like fretting and staying awake at night over the senior center. My goodness of all the people in the world that are the most capable people here. Are there stupid people as seniors? Absolutely. Naive people. Absolutely. But there's some, of, just because people retire doesn't mean they got the, they gave up their intelligence. Honestly, there's some of the most capable people, ex developers, home builders, plumbers, doctors, our seniors, if they want to do a senior center, let them do a senior center, let them sort it out themselves. Why would it be a big deal in the newspaper for God's sake? I mean, I just think it's what that shows people is we got the stupid thing going on in our community in every community. It's like somehow government has to be the answer to everything that comes up. Usually what government does is stands in the way of good ideas. That's what happens, <clears throat> man. I tell you, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy what's going on. Let's see. I got to pick and choose here. What what's left because, um, we just have 15 minutes. We had a caller that wanted to talk and I put him off. I don't know whether he'll hang on till next week and come back since we're just a weekly show. I wanted to just talk about this that I found really interesting <clears throat> and I don't have a lot of the local information, but I'll just allude to some, to some situations locally. This is at the state level in California. 
so fascinating. You've heard of the uh, uh, State Board of Equalization. I've always thought of the State Board of Equalization like I used to think of the IRS. Somebody you don't want to tangle with, but probably just people working hard and keeping track of all the money, and hopefully everything's all right down there. But the place is so screwed up, according to our own government, not according to some right-wing group, but according to our own state government, the State Board of Equalization is so corrupt, they shut the sucker down and turned it over to another group called the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. Is this unbelievable? Three state workers, including the daughter of a Sacramento area assemblyman, could lose their jobs because of a personal audit, a personnel audit, found that they were hired under questionable circumstances and at an agency riddled with nepotism. Do you know what nepotism is? N-E-P-O-T-I-S-M. That's when people hire their own people. Like a, a dad hires his daughter, hires his wife, hires his aunt, hires his brother, right? And they just keep hiring family members to work in state government. Now, in private industry, it's no big deal if, if you want to do that. Sometimes that creates problems. In the st state, what they saw that as is a lack of being fair, and sometimes it can create problems. The targeted employees include the daughter of Assemblyman Jim Cooper, Democrat Elk Grove, and the son of a former staff member of the Board of Equalization member, George Runner. It's not George Runner's kid. It's a former staff member to George Runner. So anyway, they found that this operation that has over 4,000 employees is just totally screwed up, is doing illegal activity, and uh, the tax that that when you find the legislators in California throwing a fit about an agency, they're in serious trouble. They should have been doing it for the California Public Utilities Commission, which is indeed corrupt. But the tax agency that lawmakers it said it gutted this agency in June after a series of audits showed that it failed to allocate taxes properly and that its leaders had allowed elected board members to intervene inappropriate in its daily operation. Uh, this is amazing. Nepotism. It's, a, it's illegal at the state level. The audit by the state personnel board showed that 17.5% of the Board of Equalization employees appeared to have a relative on the staff. 17.5%. There's over 4,000 of these people. The audit, all, the audit also found that the agency disregarded its only own anti-nepotism policy, which discouraged managers from hiring people who might have close relationships with fellow colleagues. So they got uh, the tax department inherited almost 4,700 Board of Equalization employees. I want you to think about this. You have to, we're forced to pay taxes Look at how many, this is what they call white collar welfare, 5,000 people just to collect your money, keep track of your money, and give it back to you in the form of welfare. So it's a mess. Now, I this fascinated me. Uh, here, here's some problems. This Cooper's daughter was allowed to, this is a legislator's daughter, was allowed to apply for a job as an information officer in 2015 after, after the application period closed. In other words, nobody else could apply. And an executive dismissed the recommendations of managers who preferred other candidates. In other words, they said, she's too late to apply, and, and we, got, we already got our candidates. They're better than her. They said, forget it. She's going to get the job. Uh, here's some other problems. A senior tax consultant working for Runner, used his position of influence to encourage the hiring of his son. Uh, this is another one. I'll, I'm going to have to abbreviate this. A legislative aide to Board of Equalization member Diane Harkey was allowed to work from the agency's New York office. This agency's got a New York office. Harkey's staff used their positions of authority to improperly influence and arguably pressure BOE executives to ensure placement of the aid to a permanent civil service position. Another one, the report recommends dismissing a public information officer who took a civil service exam too quickly 
applicants can take the exam every six months. In other words, if you fail the exam one time, you've got to wait six months to take it again. They just let her come right back, take it twice in two months, got her right on. His spouse also works for the Board of Equalization. The report calls attention to flurry of hiring employees that took place just before Jerry Brown's pension reform law took hold. In other words, they were going to change the law, and they just they just went out and gobbled up lots of people so they could bolster their employee numbers. It found that the Board of Equalization hired 27 people in the weeks just prior to the pension formula change from New York State uh, for new state workers. In other words, they got them in under the old formula, more money. In 23 cases, the hiring was unlawful because of various application deficiencies. Here's another one. Ten of these new hires were hired to staff a new call center in Culver City, a facility in Assemblyman Horton's district that he advanced when he was chairman of the board. The California Department of Tax and Fee Administration closed the call center last month. Un this is unbelievable. Now, the reason I bring this up, and I'm going to, I'm going to do a little research in Yuba and Sutter counties. You, you out there in Calusa, Butte, Placer, Sacramento, Calusa, you do it. You do it yourself. I want you to think of who's serving you in your various elected officials uh, over different departments, and who's on these, who's serving, and how many family members you have working for government. Like the ones that come to mind offhand, we have Robert Bendorf, who's the county administrator of Yuba County. And it just so happens that Robert's wife is a deputy district attorney uh, working under Pat McGrath. So together, they make probably around $400,000 a year. Now, you also have numbers of other uh, family members working in these various agencies. For instance, you have uh, Mr. Stottlemyre, Bruce, I think it's Bruce Stottlemyre, that is the assessor of Yuba County, and his wife Donna Stottlemyre is the secretary to the Board of Supervisors, right? And then you have Steve Hera, who is the, the county treasurer of Sutter County, and his wife Lori Hera is either the head or assistant for Health and Human Services. Or maybe she's over CPS or over welfare or something. So what, usually when you have these combos, you're putting out about, you know, I, I had some comments I, in the article I wrote for Territorial Dispatch called the $5 million club. People commented to me they were shocked at that figure about those employees and how much time they're spending on the homeless project. And if they're all working to, you know, Per hour, it's cost us almost $300, $3,000 an hour just for them to put their heads together. So what you have is it, at the state level, nepotism is discouraged and unlawful in a lot of cases. But at the local level, it doesn't seem like it's a problem. And I thought, maybe it's a problem. Like sometimes, is there a conflict of interest if the CAO of the county wants to do something and, and his wife is working in the district attorney's office, right? Or if he's the county treasurer and his wife's over there running health and part of health and human services. So there's multiple situations where we have nepotism in the county and city governments. Question is, maybe we should take a look at that. I think I'm going to go through and I'm going to try to give a list of all the people that uh, are are a double and triple dipping on the uh, public, what they call public service. That's where the public serves the rulers of the public. Uh, let's see. We just got a couple minutes here. Oh, let me just, since we don't really have time to do another issue, let me just remind you again about law enforcement. Pi Day, uh, call the Stevens. Jeff and Cherie Stevens out at uh, Stevens Farmhouse. They're starting to call it Mrs. Stevens Farmhouse, I know. Maybe we, we're giving the Mrs. more credit than we are the men, although there's a few men involved. But they're just token guys. 
Jeff, just token guy. So you can call 673-0406, 673-0406, and you can, if you want to, like, send a pie to a law enforcement official, they're all going to get them. But those that work in the jail, those that work on the road, I think even they even include juvenile hall, probation, CHP, sheriff, police. They're going to do Yuba, Sutter, Butte, and Calusa counties. So you can send some money, and you can sponsor some pies to be delivered. And uh, so you could call 673-0406 to see how you can do it. I'm sure they'd take your credit card over the phone, make it really easy so you don't have to mail a letter, snail mail it down. But they're located south of Yuba City. It's, it's hey, I don't know whether it's too late to order Thanksgiving pies or not, but um, obviously they sell thousands of pies for Thanksgiving. I don't know it may be a little late, but you could dial them up if you need to buy a pie from it. But you could certainly order a pie. This giveaway is December 17th, Sunday. And they're going to have, um, for all you law enforcement guys out there that are running around town listening to the show today, they're, they're going to feed you breakfast over there at that uh, Sutter County Veterans Center, Civic Center Boulevard and Butte House Road. They're going to feed breakfast. So take your kids over there and give them a free breakfast. They'll have a great time. Maybe you'll win something on December 17th. So they're going to be taking orders probably up to close to that. Uh, and maybe up to the day before, I don't know whether they could pull it off too close to that, but order some pies and support law enforcement. We got, we, we got a couple of minutes. Good. Okay. Hey, I also wanted to give you, uh, it, it's a reminder to me since we got our banner stolen for the state of Jefferson. Uh, I just saw uh, an email come through from the people down in Sonora County. There's three counties, two or three counties that are getting together, Calaveras, Sonora, is it Tuolumne maybe, that are all getting together for a uh, a town hall meeting down there to bring everybody up to date on State of Jefferson. It reminded me <clears throat> to talk about State of Jefferson. So if you don't, I had a lady that just moved back to the area. She was raised here for years and went down to Arizona for a while that she drove her nuts down there so she came back and she was saying I think I'm going to get involved with the state of Jefferson so if you don't know much about it go to this website and you can learn all about it it's SOJ S like in Sam or state state of Jefferson SOJ 51 the number 51.org SOJ 51.org and you can read up on the state of Jefferson and uh, get it on. The other thing that I'd like to mention, I mentioned this before, and some people have taken me up. If you want to send a quick message to Trump or any of his, uh, any of his folks, go to White House, one word, whitehouse.gov. And then when, when, the f when the page comes up, homepage comes up at whitehouse.gov, way up in the right-hand corner in very tiny blue letters, it says, get in touch. And when you click on get in touch, it brings up a bunch of blanks that you just fill in your name address email phone number whatever and in a box and you can just type in a short little letter there and then just send it boom it's done you can send a letter like i love what you did right there i hate what you did right there i wish you would do this right there and you can send it and be done in two minutes all right i'm done i can tell by the sound of that right that's a bad sign right there we'll be back next week uh 